from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, welcome back to the second day of the Philip, uh, Lee Phillips Annual Conference, Visualizing the Nation, Nation's Capital, Two Centuries of Mapping Washington, D.C. Session four, Names on the Land, will be introduced by John Campbell, a geographer with the U.S. Geological Survey and a member of the U.S. Uh, Board and Geographic Names. And I've also asked John to comment briefly on the BGN's role in the official BGN database, Washington, D.C. John. Um, first, we'll um, hear uh, Pamela Scott talk about um, uh, 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 leaving their mark, street names in a developing city. Uh, Pamela is well known to many people in the Washington historical community, but uh, let me um, tell you a bit about her, um, um, the variety and, and quality of the work that she's done over the years. Um, recently, uh, pa Pamela has served as a uh, professor at Cornell University. Since um, 1980, she's taught the history of Washington architecture to both architecture and public policy students here in Washington as part of the Cornell and Washington program. Uh, she's served in the past as a curator at the Library of Congress. Uh, she's currently the editor of the L'Enfant Forum. She has been the editor at uh, the Smithsonian Institution where she um, collected and uh, supervised the publication of the papers of Robert Mills. Uh, she is a prolific author. Just some of her uh, publications are um, Temple of Liberty, Building the Capital for a New Nation, that was published in 1995, uh, Capital Engineers, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in the Development of Washington, she was co-editor of uh, Designing the Nation's Capital, the 1901 Plan for Washington, D.C., and the, her article in this collection was titled The City as a Work of Art. Pamela's won many awards. Um, she um, was recently awarded a, a prize by the Inter Independent Publishers of Books She's won the Blue Pencil Award in, in uh, 2007. And um, why don't we begin, Pamela? I'm looking forward to your talk very much. Thank you, John. Now to get my lecture up. And yours down. You putting Scott on? Here we go. Invoking Shakespeare's what is past as prologue is natural for Washington historians because so much originates with and then returns to L'Enfant's plan. So it is with the naming and the renaming of Washington streets over more than two centuries. When Thomas Jefferson and James Madison met with the commissioners of the District of Columbia on September 8, 1791, they jointly determined to name the 6,111 acre city Washington, located within the District of Columbia. They further decided on a rather boring but quite rational organization for the orthogonal street names. The capital was to be the umphalos, physically and symbolically the center of the city, and thus uh, the nation. Its local meridians, north, east, and south capital streets, and the mall, divided Washington into four quadrants. Within each, streets running north and north-south would be numbered, while those running east-west would be named by the letters of the alphabet outward from the capital. 
the distance between the meridians and the farthest boundary, that on the north, was 23 squares. Each name followed by the suffixes NW, NE, SW, and SE would identify precisely where in relation to the capital each street was located. Thus, residents and visitors alike could easily orient themselves within Washington, a concern that dominated discussion of street names at the turn of the 19th to the 20th centuries when the chaos of numerous naming systems was addressed. There is no mention in official or private accounts in the early 1790s of how Washington's diagonal avenues were to be named. I believe it was L'Enfant who chose to name them after the states because the internal logic of his plan was determined before Jefferson and Madison named the city and its grid streets. The arrangement of the avenues was both geographical and political. The three avenues that traverse the city from Rock Creek to the Anacostia River fall geographically within the city as the states for which they were named fall in the country. Northern avenues uh, named after the northern states are clustered in the northern part of the city. With the exception of New York Avenue, those named for the central states radiate from the capital located at the city center. The southern state avenues traverse the city's southern section on Capitol Hill. Now for their political content. The president's grounds bisect um, New York Avenue because Washington was inaugurated at Federal Hall in New York, designed by L'Enfant in 1788 to 1789. Pennsylvania Avenue also abuts these grounds because Washington served most of his uh, two terms in Philadelphia. Notice how Rhode Island Avenue seems to have been added as an afterthought relative to the other New England state avenues. Rhode Island was the last state to ratify the Constitution. In the, <laughs> in the autumn of 1789, Washington toured the New England states. And when returning uh, to New York, he purposely, in fact, ostentatiously, skirted Rhode Island. Rhode Island did not vote for the Constitution until May 1790. In mid-August, the president made a second tour, a 10-day flying trip to Rhode Island. With the exception of Delaware Avenue, the state avenues um, that abut Capitol Square, um, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and New Jersey, were all states where the Continental Congresses met. Delaware was the first state to ratify the Constitution, presumably given its prestigious location for that reason. Truly, the names and placement of the state, avenue made, state avenues made L'Enfant's plan a microcosm of a new nation, its founding history um, and geography embodied physically in the capital city's organization. The choice of numbers and letters for the grid of neighborhood streets was probably to avoid the inevitable conflicts attendant on naming them after individuals. Would the revolution's military leaders have precedence over the signers or members of the Continental and Confederation Congresses, for example? Would the names be alphabetical or by rank? An undated draft letter addressed to Colonel L'Enfant by Bostonian Thomas Swolcott, a Revolutionary War veteran and founding mem member of the Massachusetts Historical Society, was probably written shortly after he read L'Enfant's lengthy, lengthy description, description of his plan first published in Philadelphia's Gazette of the United States on December 25, 1791. Wolcott's main interest was running the federal cities, was naming the federal city squares after generals and statesmen. The few names he suggested for its streets are not those recognized today as the era's most notable men. Only six new states subsequently had named avenues in L'Enfant's original city. Four of them uh, replaced uh, unnamed avenues on the plan, while two uh, were created as part of the city's first land reclamation project. Vermont, the, fort, the 14th state, was admitted on March 4, 1791, in time for L'Enfant to include it with the other New England states. Fifteen months later, on June 1, 1792, Kentucky was admitted, and its named avenue took the place of an unnamed one that ran southeast from the large square 12 blocks east of the Capitol, now Lincoln Park. 
His name appeared on, its name appeared on both the large Samuel Hill and Thacker and Valence maps printed in September and November of 1792. It is entirely possible that L'Enfant left these particular avenues blank in anticipation of new states quickly joining the Union. Real estate development subsequently determined where the state named avenues were located within L'Enfant City. Although Tennessee became a state on June 1st, 1796, its name was not used for the unnamed avenue that ran northeast from Lincoln Park until 1821 when that area of Capitol Hill began to be developed with streets opened and graded. It then joined um, the other southern avenues there. Building City Hall um, in Judiciary Square in, in the early 1820s was the impetus for grading and naming uh, Louisiana and Indiana avenues. Louisiana having entered the Union in 1812, Indiana in 1816. Developer George Sweeney first addressed the lot, uh, advertised the lots on Ohio Avenue, uh, located between Pennsylvania Avenue and the Washington Canal, 28 years after that state ratified in 1803. Located in the heart of Murder Bay, Ohio Avenue became a notoriously ad dangerous address in the 19th century. After it was obliterated for construction of the Federal Triangle, no developer or neighborhood would touch it. Um, hence, we have East and West Ohio Drives on Haynes Point. Maine was admitted to the Union in March 1820 and Missouri in August the following year. In May 1822, two War Department engineers, Isaac Robodeau, then Chief of the Topographical Engineers, but L'Enfant's assistant in 1791-92, and James Kearney laid out Maine and Missouri Avenues at the east end of the Mall. City surveyor Frederick de Kraft formally recorded their plats in 1828. This new neighborhood was the centerpiece of a joint federal district project to drain and fill low-lying grounds in the public reservations at the foot of Capitol Hill for sale to private purchasers. A mini digressive case study, please. In 1911, Congress suggested changing the name of Main Avenue to Mall Avenue in order to call the new diagonal avenue laid out connecting Pennsylvania Avenue to Union Station Plaza, Main Avenue. It didn't happen. In 1935, when the mall's east end was being cleared of all buildings to conform to the Senate Park Commission plan, citizens from Maine, Missouri, Ohio, and Oklahoma, all with short avenues, lobbied for naming rights for the uh, mall's four new east-west streets. In August 1937, Franklin D. Roosevelt, in the, at the behest of his uncle Frederick Delano, chairman of the National Capital Planning Commission, who was in charge of the mall's uh, redevelopment, vetoed the con congressional resolution that ordered the new placement of these state names. Delano and Roosevelt suggested Water Street Southwest to be named Main Avenue, and it was. The present uh, day Missouri Avenue that runs between North Capitol Street and Georgia Avenue was the fourth name for that roadway. Its name changed uh, from Lehigh to Oregon to Connecticut, uh, to Concord, to military. A telling sequence from university to state to city to civil war. A subsequent system, uh, as subsequent systems for naming the streets were implemented. Maine, Missouri, Oklahoma, and Ohio seemingly did not have adequate prestige in 1937 to earn them mall street names. In fact, singling out any four states would have been politically dangerous. Independence Avenue is now, is now where Maine might have been and Constitution Avenue is, Missouri, is where Missouri was to go. In 1821, Treasury Department employees John Barkley and Richard Cutts lived diagonally across the intersection of Vermont Avenue and H Street. Um, they were commissioners for opening 15 and a half street along the east side of the common grounds that in 1824 became Lafayette Square. Cutts had just built his house overlooking these grounds and needed both an address and a street from which to enter his front door. Stephen Decatur was in the same situation at the corner of H and 16 and a half street. Within a year of building his house, Cutts' brother-in-law, former President James Madison, purchased it. The widowed Dolly Madison moved there in 1837. Between July 1849 and 
uh, July 1852, city authorities discussed renaming these two half streets to something more dignified considering their location just north of the president's house. They posited renaming 15 and a half Street Madison Street and 16 and a half Street Monroe Street. When the city council made its final decision in May 1859, 15 and a half Street became Madison Place and 16 and a half Street was named Jackson Place. Clark Mills's equestrian statue of Andrew Jackson uh, now dominated the square and was the impetus for a new wave of residential building in the neighborhood. The city council's resolution noted that if the name change was approved by the mayor, he shall obtain uh, the, the assent of the President of the United States, who was James Buchanan at the time. The interaction of city and federal authorities relative to various kinds of control over naming Washington streets was historically a complex one, destined to become more so in the following decades. The real story of Washington street names um, began in the 1850s when residential subdivisions began to be laid out in Washington County east of the Rev and east of the, uh, east of the Anacostia River and between Boundary Avenue and the District of Columbia and uh, Maryland Line. The earliest mention I have found of a subdivision actually being uh, constructed dates from July 1853 when retired Postmaster General Amos Kendall was constructing 10 um, cottages intended for rental on his farm, Kendall Green, at the city county line in Northeast. Because they were built on two acre lots along uh, an existing street, no new street names were involved. Kendall's estate became uh, Gallaudet College. Union Town on the eastern shore of the Anacostia River was a very early Washington planned subdivision, probably the second uh, after Kendall Green and had more of the characteristics we seek in defining subdivisions. A bit of historical context. The, front, the threat of disunion over the issue of slavery in the new territories of Texas and California, and the old one, the District of Columbia, was debated nationally and, uh, and in Congress during 1849-50. The volatility of these debates that led to the controversial compromise of 1850 prompted the government to build up the Army and Navy. Uniontown was intended primarily to provide inexpensive housing for the Navy Yard's burgeoning workforce. In 1854, Union Land Company's three developers bought 100 acres of the Talbert Farm in Anacostia and laid out a grid town at the end of the 11th Street Bridge across from the Navy Yard. They named all the streets in Uniontown's grid after the 14 presidents from Washington to Pierce obviously their statement of s solidarity with the Union. I have not yet cracked the code of the pattern relating the president's names vis-a-vis -vis the location of their streets. There may not be one. <laughs> In 1858, just when suburban tracts were being sought by real estate investors, the pseudonymous Franklin suggested a system to replace Washington's prosaic numbered and lettered street names with more meaningful ones while preserving their alphabetical order. Streets north and south of, the, south of the capital would be named for notable Americans, while the numbered streets east and west of the capital might be named for American rivers, cities, or states. This new interest in the city's uh, street names may have been stimulated by Uniontown street names. Sporadically over the next half century, several Washingtonians interested in geographic names suggested systems for renaming the old numbered and lettered streets and, and the subdivision streets based on their rational organization, most dependent on the names of eminent Americans, places, and institutions. The mild subdivision frenzy of the 1850s was brought to a halt by the Civil War because um, Washington was the center of war effort. The population soared and building increased dramatically in many underdeveloped parts of the city. The government continued to grow after the war's end and post-war building activity moved beyond Boundary Street for, for, for many reasons. Moving to single family homes not subject to city taxes and located on higher ground in the country, surrounded by old growth forests or nurseries or fruit trees, solved economic and health issues at once. No longer was a house in the country reserved for the well-to-do as estates were broken up. The very name of Washington's third subdivision 
Mount Pleasant, alludes to its many amenities, as did its tree-named streets. Piney Branch Road that meandered through part of S.P. Brown's estate that he laid out in 1865, recording its plat a year later, may well have suggested naming its streets after trees. Certainly, he advertised the importance of trees as, an Im as a key part in um, the subdivision's bucolic environment. Each plot, quote, each plot is improved with some 50 or 60 varieties of fruit trees. It is of easy access, being only a short walk from the terminus of the 14th Street passenger railroad, the coming of street railways, the crucial factor in the boom of the 1870s. New suburbs close to the county city line were ironically spurred by development within the city. The building boom of the early uh, 1850s drove lot and house prices up. More, moreover, the new residents paid a hefty tax levied for opening and paving streets that formerly existed on paper only. Quality of life was also an important issue for the young families of a new generation of government clerks. Dust or mud were the two alternatives res residents faced either walking or driving on streets throughout the city. Street trees and parked streets were two solutions and accelerated um, beginning in the early 1850s, revived under the uh, territorial government uh, in 1871 because all the streets had been, all the trees had been cut down for firewood during the war and the, st and the streets were ruined by the caissons of military equipment. Certainly, um, newspaper accounts in the early 1850s record a great deal of real estate speculation and division of farms and estates into smaller parcels, say 15 uh, or 20 acres as opposed to 300 acres, probably part of the process of creating new suburban subdivisions. Proper properties in the county on both sides of the river were, count were country properties, large estates, farms, and woodlands into the early 20th century. Maps in Hopkins' 1879 atlas show settle settlement patterns that have already be begun to evolve within the subdivisions clustered along Boundary Avenue and along the extensions of some of the city's major thoroughfares into the county. His, ma his map of the part of the county um, east of the Anacostia shows Uniontown, um, no, shows Uniontown as well as other projected developments. In all parts of the county, um, the land was traversed by a series of roads uh, with, few crossroads, with a few crossroads settlements occurring. The name Brightwood was first used about 1861 after a post office named Brighton, recently located there, duplicated the name of another post office in Montgomery County, which of course resulted in misdirected mail. The main thoroughfare out of Washington and through Brightwood was the extension of 7th Street Northwest, first called 7th Street Extended, then 7th Street Turnpike, then 7th Street Road, then Brightwood Avenue. In 1907, it became Georgia Avenue after citizens of the state complained that their um, avenue um, that, that L'Enfant had located in Southeast was now a slum in an industrial water uh, in an industrial area and um, going to be underwater. The Businessmen's Association of Washington opposed the change from Brightwood to Georgia because it violated L'Enfant's plan and would seriously harm business and interests on Capitol Hill. Moreover, it would, the association claimed, introduce the vicious French custom of renaming historic old thoroughfares. <laughs> Little did they know. Today, Georgia Avenue is Washington's longest continuous commercial corridor, beginning on the north side of Pennsylvania Avenue, um, across from the National Archives, and continuing beyond the district line into downtown Silver Spring, Maryland. The county roads, lanes really, were named for nearby estates, Linthicum and Calorama, for example, or for major property owners, Fox Hall and Pierce, or for natural features, Piney Branch Road and Sandy Spring Road, names familiar to many of you. A few scattered uh, remaining uh, fragments of these roads remind us of their um, rural character. Part of the old military road, Grant Road since 1922 is on the left, and a winding section of Rock Creek Church Ford Road 
on the right, both west of Rock Creek Park, um, remain. Much of present-day Grant Road was part of the 34 miles of military roads General John Barnard built to connect the 68 forts and batteries that protected Washington during the Civil War. Thus, there was a logical progression between the change in name, Military Road to Grant Road, more than six decades after the Civil War ended. I actually anticipated and wanted this Grant Road to have been named for General U.S. Grant III, an engineer who became the head of the National Capital Park and Planning Commission, but he wasn't posted to Washington until, 18, uh, until 1923, a year after the name was changed. About the same time, suburban divisions, uh, subdivisions resumed in Washington County in the mid-1860s, Washington City had its own version. Union towns were the last overtly n national and politically motivated street names until 1866, when Grant Place and Washington Place, each a block long, were inserted between F and G streets. Grant Place located between 9th and 10th streets and Washington Place north of the City Hall. Washington and Grant were the only two generals elected presidents who had been commanders in chief of all the armies um, in their respective wars. Washington's achievements leading to the founding of the nation and grants to its saving. This was a harbinger of what was to come, the beginning of a proliferation of street names in Washington associated with the Civil War's national and local military heroes. It was not until 1932 that Grant and Washington places, uh, their names were changed to G Place. This intensification of the urban living experience spread to many desirable neighborhoods. Several established Washingtonians maximized the value of their land holdings by running streets through one or more squares and building more modest row houses than those found on the main streets and avenues. Bankers W. W. Corcoran and Eliza Riggs, Senator and subsequently Secretary of the Treasury John Sherman, Mayor Richard Wallach, and Hotelier uh, Henry Willard, all named uh, mid-square streets after themselves and developed uh, buildings along them. Two of the block long streets inserted in the squares between DuPont and Iowa circles were named for trees. In 1869, Chestnut Street was changed to Sampson Street in honor of George Whitefield Sampson, the president of Columbian College. In the county subdivisions, each individual developer laid out the streets um, laid out the streets within their tracks according to topography and to maximize the development of their differently shaped properties. They paid no regard to Washington street patterns and they personalized the names of their streets. Some chose the names of family members while others were influenced by their location vis-a-vis -vis local landmarks or current events. LeDroit Street was the first name, um, carries the first name of the son of Am Amzi Barber who laid out LeDroit Park in 1873. Streets in the old Columbian College grounds, the predecessor of George Washington University, were named for early American colleges, Harvard, Yale, Princeton. Nearby were Farragut and Sheridan streets. In 1871, Georgetown, Washington, and Washington County became one legal entity, the city of Washington, under a territorial form of government. Its Board of Public Works under the direction of Alexander Boss Shepard began an ambitious program to rebuild and improve Washington's war-ravaged streets. Rebuilding these streets was a priority, as was instituting some regularity in the names of streets in all parts of the now consolidated city. In 1873, the president's names for Uniontown streets were changed to lettered and numbered streets to conform to the new citywide street naming system. Three years later, many of Georgetown's venerable street names, some called after its prominent residents and some recording its history, Montgomery and Congress streets, for example, uh, were changed to numerical ones to conform to the streets to the town's new status as a Washington suburb. Although phenomenally productive during its four years of existence, the territorial government bankrupted the city and allegations of corruption led to Washington going into federal receivership. Congressional investigators recommended that an Army engineer be placed in charge of the repair and improvement of Washington's streets and waterways. 
to be one of three members of a board of commissioners who administered the city's uh, municipal affairs until 1967. Seemingly, amidst repaving streets, caring for the parklets, creating park streets, planting street trees, and implementing sewage, water, gas, and electrical infrastructures connected with all the city's transportation arteries, and coordinating street plans for the rapidly expanding city, naming Washington streets was a paltry duty. Not so. In <clears throat> Landowners, whether professional uh, real estate developers or those hoping to increase the value of their properties, had their small, medium, and large-sized holdings surveyed, laid out, and approved by the DC Surveyor's Office. It was said of LaDroit Park streets that they go nowhere and connect with nothing. The Board of Commissioners began the long um, legal and physical process of bringing the streets into conformity with one another. In 1887, Engineer Commissioner William Ludlow produced a map denominated the Permanent System of Highways, which you see here, which, uh, which was aptly um, to counteract what was aptly called the evil of the misfit subdivisions. As it gradually carried, uh, as it gradually carried the majestic majesty of L'Enfant's city plan into the expanded city, an important part of its implementation was naming the new streets, avenues, and circles. Um, the names of Army officers, uh, especially its engineer officers, played a large part in this early plan. Enter stage right, James McMillan. Soon after he was elected a senator from Michigan in 1889, he was appointed to the Senate Com Committee on the District of Columbia. Over the next decade, he applied his knowledge gained from working on Detroit's Board of Public Works to the modernization of Washington's physical infrastructure. His end goal was to prepare the city for a modern urban plan for its, for its monumental core that guided its future development of public buildings in accordance with the greatness of L'Enfant's plans and its founding governmental buildings. He formed the Senate Park Commission in the spring of 1901, choosing Daniel Burnham to oversee some of the nation's premier visual artists. But in the middle of the preparatory decade, in April 1896, McMillan sponsored legislation directing engineer commissioner Colonel Charles Powell to perfect the system of naming streets and highways in the district in accordance with the permanent system of highways being developed by the office. The first step was to eliminate duplication of, of names in streets, alleys, courts, places, and roads, also terraces. Those with objectionable, name, objectionable names, there, there was a nigger alley, uh, were to be renamed as were those names lacking in euphony. I can't give you an example of what they meant. Um, McMillan stipulated that the new names be those of dead distinguished Americans. On the recommendation of the city commissioners, an 1898 House bill authorized the president to appoint a commission of three or more district residents to compile a list of suitable street names. In their report, the commissioners noted that they believed the question is a very important one. Whatever system is adopted should receive careful and thorough attention, and whatever system is adopted should also be made comprehensive enough to cover the entire district and not only principal streets, but also minor ones, inhabited alleys. The bill suggested three possible categories for names of major streets, the names of presidents, cities, and America's rivers and town and lakes. The names of minor streets and alleys were to be distinguished by the suffix, uh, suffixes place, alley, court, terrace, instead of street. The location of all streets in respect to the capital should be maintained via the initial letter of whatever names were selected. A month later, the Senate Committee on the, on the District countered with a more inclusive bill. All the lettered streets were to be renamed um, with, new, um, with new names beginning with the same letter of the alphabet, LaDroit Park before and after here. Um, to eliminate duplicate names for streets, alleys, courts, etc., new names should be chosen except in cases where streets nearly coincide in alignment, in which case the street should have one 
one name over con continuous blocks. Minor streets, alleys, etc., should be um, named with the proper, proper suffix, alley, terrace, etc., of the name of the next principal street in the direction of the capital. So Grant Street should be followed by Grant Place. District streets extended into a subdivision should continue to be known by the name, um, uh, uh, should continue be, to be known by the name of the DC straight street within that subdivision. Very importantly, the bill stipulated that the district commissioners would determine the name of highways within any new, within any new subdivision. The bill also proposed what came to be known as the eminent American plan for Washington street names. It established a hierarchy beginning with the names of presidents, then vice presidents, Supreme Court justices, speakers of the House, um, uh, the more distinguished members of the various cabinets, and other American citizens who have rendered distinguished service to their country. All dead, of course. Um, and you see what's happening is that the, the people who work for the government are promoting a national system of naming streets that goes back to L'Enfant's state street names. Uh, whereas the city residents are, um, are uh, holding on to a more personal uh, system. During the first day of the decade of the 20th century, street nomenclature was a much debated issue between citizens, the engineer commissioners, and Congress, as the engineers gradually came up with a system that was copacetic with the names of L'Enfant's plan. At the end of Alphabet City, two-syllable names of people ranging from presidents to poets, from cities to states, to name just a few um, that were chosen uh, for the next ring around the old city. They were followed by three-syllable names, also in alphabetical order, which brought Washington street names to the borders in most parts of the city. I live at the corner of Whittier Street, one above Van Buren, the last of the three-syllable proper names, uh, five blocks from the Maryland line. The names of streets and flowers fill out the, food, the remaining few blocks above me, Aspen, Butternut, Cedar, Dahlia. The process of street naming in Washington goes on. Periodically, neighborhood activists or the city fathers will rename a part of a street associated with someone who has made notable contributions to the city's uh, welfare. Uh, city Council Member Michael Brown uh, proposed last year that Pennsylvania Avenue be renamed. Um, Washington street names are now an interesting mix of national and local interest, preserving uh, its history as the national capital while uh, responding to the local achievements of its diverse population. Now channeling again Shakespeare, what is in a name? Goes on, a rose by any other name. Um, it's a little known fact that in fact George Washington's uh, um, original symbol uh, was a rose, um, and it's on it's on it's in the sculptural arch above 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, and that's another that's another lecture that's already in the can. Um, um, I would suggest that Washington desperately needs a gazetteer to sort out the history of all who who were all these people that. Uh, the streets are named for, and what was the succession uh, of their naming, which is a, is a moving target. Thank you very much. Yes, please. My explanation is that in 18th century typography, the letters I and J uh, were written in exactly the same way. And so to avoid duplication and confusion, there is no J Street. Yes? Uh, actually, there is a J Street in Southeast, but it's South J-A-Y, yes. <laughs> you see why we need a jazzeteer, Dick.
idea actually came from Jefferson because when he was governor, he tried to do that in Richmond and changed the, the street right around the mm -hmm. Capitol. One, two, three, and, mm -hmm. and A, B, C. And um, uh, I thought that was sort of interesting. It's just a comment. Uh, Dick Stevenson's comment is that he did research several years ago and decided that uh, it was Jefferson who decided on the, the numbered and the lettered streets because uh, he had uh, planned the area around the Capitol in Richmond uh, in a similar fashion. Um, uh, Philadelphia is is another possibility. Uh, Part of it, yeah, but it wasn't a consistent system as in Washington. Iris. One of the last streets named uh, for a person last year was Bud Dog Way. Way. I almost included that. <laughs> and Hilda Mason Place. Now, all of the new streets that are coming in are have suffixes of way, place, whatever, to, to distinguish them from the streets. And they're usually just a block long um, associated with that person. It's near the convention center downtown. He was a and developer. <laughs> Bud was a developer, a parking lot owner, and a major player politically in the city. I think everyone who has a street named after them is a major player in the city. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, it's unusual, letters of the alphabet of the 26 letters, four are missing, mm -hmm. not only J, but X, Y, and Z are missing. I guess they ran out of space. Yuma is there. No, the letters by themselves, A, B, C, oh, a, D. A, yes. yes. Um, they may have run out of space, yes. The, because it was only 23, the, the furthest was 23 yeah. blocks. Okay. Um, of course, when they started through this whole process of finding appropriate names of two syllables and three syllables, uh, they simply couldn't find enough names to make it into the Z and the, yeah. Also, another comment. You may have seen this book. Unusual name, George Washington Never Slept Here. <laughs> Stories Behind the Street Names of Washington, D.C., in they which <clears throat> there's a very nice description <laughs> of most of the streets. Thank Not you. exactly a gazetteer, but nevertheless. Well, thank you for bringing that to our attention. In the back, yellow shirt. You're uh, I, a little block away, I live a block away from uh, Columbia Street, um, which, is, which is near um, uh, 9th Street. And then there's Columbia Road. Road. Do you know why there's two of them, and are they related to the District of Columbia in name? We have a street named after our city. They, um, <laughs> that's, that's an interesting point. Yes, they, I believe they both are named after the District of Columbia or Christopher, Colum Christopher Columbus, but then so is the district. Um, the only one that I know anything about is, is, at this point is Columbia Road. I was afraid people were going to ask me about this kind of question. Uh, I have it all in my files at home. <laughs> Send me an email. Why California is street and not avenue? Um, there have been many California streets. <clears throat> um, and in fact, that's, that's the kind of duplication that was, and they were scattered all over the city. Um, the short answer is that it started out as a, uh, a privately sponsored street. When the city council renames the, the single blocks after someone, do they actually replace the original name, or is it meant to be a, a second name in effect? They they add a little, you know, block long sign, so it doesn't. It, it I think the address. Now maybe you know about this. The address does remain the same, Iris, or not? I think they have both names on the street. On this sign. But when you send mail, do you send it to the street or do you send it to the new? Yeah. I, I know that, yes, they're, they're very much honorific, but that is a good point. Yes. Was there any precedent for the quadrant system? Was, is this the first city that had the four? Philadelphia 
City Hall Square was in the center, the four but broad it didn't avenues. Have, but the names, it didn't it have. Suffixes. I, that's probably, um, again, Jefferson, um, because of the confusion in Philadelphia. Uh, but the naming of the streets in Philadelphia were such that it wouldn't have been, and of course what was actually developed at that time was a very small part of, but once the city filled out, there would have been probably a lot of confusion. Uh, Philadelphia was the basis of uh, Jefferson's plan, um, and I have another lecture on that. Um, I see people pointing as well, and I'm not sure if they're pointing or raising hands. All the way at the back, on the right. Good morning. Um, I live on um, Bates Street, Northwest Washington. It's right off of um, North Capitol Street. Mm -hmm. And um, it's uh, a very interesting community in terms of um, the number of um, building sites and so forth that have been named for uh, abolitionists or... Uh, folks who were involved in the uh, Civil War. And uh, so we were trying to figure out, in terms of Bates, Bates uh, was, the, uh, was in, uh, headed up African-American troops in the Civil War. And I wondered, if that, is that why uh, the street is named Bates? Yes, and there are many, many, many streets um, in Washington named for Civil War uh, veterans. One of the interesting um, stories uh, that I remembered this morning is that when Hyatt Street, H-I-A-T-T, -T, was renamed by, by the commissioner's new system, Bryant Street, for William Cullen Bryant, the poet, um, the, there was local outrage about that because uh, one person uh, stood up at a, at a meeting and said, who is Bryant? Is he the poet or is he the guy who was hanged for murder? Uh, in Southwest, you know, uh, eight months ago. Uh, we know who Hyatt was, he said. Hyatt was a civic activist in this community uh, and a Civil War veteran. Uh, one very interesting study just on its own would be the names of the streets associated with Civil War veterans. Uh, what, what were the previous names for... Uh, Hawaii Avenue and Alaska Avenue, since those are very recent, recent states. I should know the answer to that, but I don't off the top of my head. Again, email me. Um, the um, last state to get a state avenue was actually Arizona, behind Hawaii and Alaska. Uh, and, and interestingly enough, Arizona was also one of the last two states to get a second uh, statue in Statuary Hall. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Yeah. Don't know. You see, it all happened um, after 1871, and so it's. I'd have to. It's not easily found out. Um, there are two major resources to find the answers to this information: the D.C. Surveyor's Office. Um, and then the engineer's records that are in the DC archives. Yes, questions at the back. Uh, two things, one is that uh, Columbia Road, uh, just before it was named Columbia, after, I'm pretty certain, a number of sources say uh, from the Columbian College that was up there, mm -hmm. uh, it was Tin Pot Road. I think Tin they Pot were Road, interesting. They were desperate for another name. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the other is that the early usage of the north, south, uh, mm -hmm. east, west was to just uh, say whether it was north or south. So F Street North could have been in northwest or northeast, but the numbered streets were east or west. Uh, but everyone understood there was the north quadrant, the yep. east quadrant, the west quadrant and the south quadrant. The quadrants were understood, but the usage was only to name whether it was mm -hmm. north or south, east or west. Well, related to that, Boundary Avenue was not changed to Florida Avenue until um, uh, 1890. And the reason that the commissioners changed it 
uh, they stated overtly is that investors buying property from outside the city would think if they were buying land uh, facing Boundary Avenue that they were in the back of beyond. And so uh, just to protect the real estate interests, that name was changed. I think my time is up. Uh, Ralph asked me to say, um, uh, um, t talk for a few minutes about the uh, geographic names information system data that's available for DC. Uh, this is part of the official um, geographic names uh, database that's uh, official by the uh, by the authority of the U.S. Board on Geographic Names. There is the, there's a collection of uh, names for each state and for the District of Columbia that, that serve as the official federal repository of names. However, these names don't, um, how do I advance the slide from here? Oh, there it is, <laughs> thank you. Um, the, um, uh, these names, however, the, this collection doesn't include uh, street names. Uh, the board uh, perhaps uh, uh, assents to that view, the, uh, the French pernicious purpose of changing, a uh, practice of uh, changing names. Uh, usually uh, street names are under the purview of local or state authorities, and so the uh, federal board doesn't um, uh, track the um, track street names, but we deal with uh, the names of geographic features, and um, uh, it's useful for mapping purposes for the board to also monitor uh, building names and the names of um, the names of schools, the other um, uh, public um, public buildings, and and the names of dams and so on. So, uh, if you too want to um, access the uh, the DC names, uh, you can go to these uh, websites. Uh, there are more than 18,000 uh, DC place names that are collected in the, um, in, in the uh, District Columbia um, files. Um, when I, uh, I met Ralph uh, when, when I was on the staff of the Board on Geographic Names in uh, the early 90s, and I worked with a colleague, Eve Edwards. We, added more than uh, 2,000 new names in that period. Um, uh, we went to the um, uh, Washington Historical Society to various libraries and so on and reviewed uh, maps and historical references. Um, almost 800 of the names that we entered were names of features that no longer exist, such as the names of, uh, of mills and um, uh, hotels that, that no longer existed. Uh, we, we tracked them as um, variant names uh, where, where the names had existed, but the uh, structure was still there. So let, let's move forward. And uh, here's a, here's a um, I hope everyone can see this. I, I was thinking that it would be a little bit bigger uh, from the uh, experience yesterday in the other auditorium. But um, uh, here, here's a main screen. Um, we'll take a name. You see, you see it, uh, Georgetown listed. Um, we've uh, allowed variant names to be included. And so when we do a query on this um, a name selection, uh, you see that there are 59 uh, records that come up. Some of them, um, you see, uh, like, oh, I, I can't even read this. Um, <laughs> Uh, Bank of Columbia. Um, you might wonder where, how, what's the association with Georgetown, but uh, you'll um, keep track of those names. Uh, there'll be examples of the Bank of Columbia, Battery, Georgetown, and uh, Capital Traction Powerhouse as we go along here. Here's the, uh, here's the reason why Bank of Columbia comes up in a Georgetown search. Uh, you see at the bottom, uh, a variant name was Georgetown Town Hall and Mayor's Office. And then uh, if you'll, uh, as, as you're using this, the uh, blue term citation is a, a link term to the uh, citation. And that's also recorded in the history field um, as a code, but um, 
uh, if you click on the citation, then you, they get the uh, uh, citation uh, in a, to a fuller extent. Um, you'll recall the, the second record that we saw in the search was Battery Georgetown, and here's the record for that and the citation. Uh, we have the um, coordinates uh, based on uh, transposing the uh, old map to, uh, to a modern map. Um, th these might not be as precise as GPS uh, coordinates from the, um, in, in the field, but um, they'll, they'll get you to the spot. So let's, let's imagine that we want to look for all the batteries in, in uh, DC records. We can do that in this search. Uh, and we see that there are 15 uh, that, and historical means it's not a qualitative statement. It simply our term for, uh, to connote that the, the feature no longer exists. Uh, interestingly, the, uh, since I worked in, the, um, in this data compilation, the uh, elevations have been assigned to these uh, points based on their geographic coordinates. Uh, matching it to a digital elevation model. Uh, you remember from our first search that there was a capital traction company. Here, here's that record. Um, and you see the, uh, that it has variant names, the Washington, uh, that it was the livery stables, and then the, uh, it belonged to the Washington George Way, Georgetown Railway. Notice on the right-hand side, that, that you have options to, to map this point in various maps in that uh, right-hand column. So let's do that with the national map. And you see that, the, um, that that point is near the uh, Georgetown waterfront on, in this satellite image. So, uh, That's, we've done this, there is a more advanced form uh, that you can use. This, this is the advanced um, selection uh, table. You can query on decision date. Uh, you can make a geographic box based on the geographic coordinates to, to say, I want to find all the place names in a certain neighborhood. Um, and um, here we're, we're searching for board decisions. Um, Decisions of the Board on Geographic Names, any name within the District of Columbia. And uh, we get a list there of um, 19 decisions. That uh, the first one dates from the earliest, uh, from the establishment of the Board in 1890. Um, so let's quickly go to Anacostia River as a uh, Board decision. And um, so there, there's a bit of uh, explanation about that. But um, for these board decisions, we, we have records within the uh, uh, Board on Geographic Names uh, library. That's where the arrow points to. Uh, I couldn't get this on the screen, but there's an option to click on those, those records. And so let's imagine that we're doing that in the next screen here. And we, in this collection, of uh, original material that, that pertains to the board's decision. Here is a scanned uh, letter from uh, John Wesley Powell when he was director of the U.S. Geological Survey asking for a decision on whether the name should be Anacostia River or Eastern Branch. So that's, that's a taste of the uh, wealth of information that's available uh, online at no charge. Uh, you can uh, Look it up as soon as you go home. Thank you, John. It's a very powerful tool um, for throughout the United States, Board and Geographic Names database. Uh, John just mentioned 18,000 hits for Washington, D.C., records for Washington, D.C., but this uh, Two million across the country, and uh, he goes back to the original uh, data. Um, the board was established in 1890, and uh, John Wesley Powell, and uh, you know, was uh, very much involved in that. I will take a 15-minute break. We'll return at 10:45 uh, for session 
Five, mapping across nations with moderator Roberta Stevens, Assistant Chief of Geography and Map Division and past president of the American Library Association. It's in 15 minutes. I welcome you to the fifth session of our conference. This is Mapping Across the Generations. And I'm going to introduce our first speaker of the session, Dan Bailey, who is a professor of visual arts and director of the Imaging Research Center at the University of Maryland at Baltimore County. His teaching and research straddle the areas of animation and interactive and time-based media. Bailey is also a second-generation fine art photographer and has been working with the panoramic image for most of his career. Dan's films and animations have received numerous national and international awards and have been included in the permanent collections of the Museum of Modern Art and the Georges Pompidou Center in Paris, France. His work has been screened at the Kennedy Center, Whitney Museum, and Museum of Modern Art, and broadcast on HBO and PBS. Currently, he is working on a major research project visualizing early Washington, D.C. For the last 12 years, Dan has been the director of UMBC's Imaging Research Center, which is dedicated to investigating new technologies and their use for interpreting and presenting content. Since its inception in 1987, artists and researchers across disciplines have collaborated with the center whose state-of-the-art facilities enable research in 3D visualization, immersive technologies, interactivity, installation, animation, high-definition video, and sound. So please join me in welcoming Dan Bailey. The imaging of the Imaging Research Center is the important word, and if you can't see the screen, you're probably going to be disappointed, so try to, try to get close. Um, as you can hear from my introduction, the word archaeologist, historian, architecture, cartographer did not appear. Um, so I'm really dependent on a huge amount of scholarship, and a few of those people are in the room, and uh, uh, Don Hawkins has been instrumental for this, Pamela Scott. I don't think Peter Chirico of the USGS is here. Um, he was instrumental. And actually, the Library of Congress, the fact that you have all your stuff or much of your stuff online, this would have not have happened 10 years ago when I started on this journey. Um, and what I'm going to do is walk you through really quick. Some of you are aware of phase one, which is sort of the first four years, and then that led to a another effort, which is the um, what I'm going to quickly call phase two. So the Imaging Research Center, we do a lot of different stuff with technology. Um, but what is interesting to this particular project is we do a lot of virtual reality, um, master planning. We are a research center. We're not a production area. So we're always trying to find a new technology or some research aspect that we can work on. This was a project with MIT. We rebuilt and turned a video of um, the Herva Synagogue that was proposed by Louis Kahn for Israel in 1968. Um, we have a huge contract with NASA Goddard. We do a lot of modeling of potential um, satellites. This is a neuron firing in your brain. You have a gazillion of these happening right at this very second. That's an animation. We do a lot of fun stuff. This is called Euphoria. This is actually um, happy faces and people shopping at the beach. Um, this was a feature, feature length film that we did, and this is a lot of special effects just worked into this. Um, and I threw this one in. This is one of your neighbors right down the street. This is the National Academy of Sciences on the National Mall at 21st Street. We're doing the I app for them. They just refurbished their dome. Um, that's gold, by the way. And up there are, is a depiction of sort of the 1920s version of science. And the, it's really hard to understand, so we're making an I app that you can hold around and it tracks the images and you would be able to read the glyphs and read the iconography. So we're working on that. So this is sort of what we do. And we get a lot of interesting ideas that come through. 
And um, about 10 years ago, a group wanted to do a two-hour documentary on Benjamin Henley de Trobe, um, his life. And obviously, a lot of it was going to be focused on his work at the US Capitol. The pre he worked on the pre-fire Capitol, and he worked on the Capitol rebuilding it after the 1814 fire. And obviously, they wanted to see what the Capitol was going to look like at that time. And they came to us, and we were sort of talking about it. Obviously, they're concerned about money. And this film actually happened, but they never raised the amount of money that they hoped to. It never was a two-hour um, John Adams kind of piece. It ended up being a one-hour document. It's actually great, but we were not ultimately involved after four years of um, doing some work. So the, the, the funny story is, is that I actually went to the public library. I'm not a historian. I went to the public library assuming I was going to get three or four coffee table books on what Washington, D.C. looked like in 1790-1800. Well, you all know there isn't any books. There's a whole bunch of books on what Rome looked like 2,000 years ago. There's no books on what Washington, D.C. really looked like. Um, and I started moving up the, the library chain um, and ended up at universities and ended up at the Library of Congress and um, started making some connections. And this is really sort of what started the journey for me. Um, and we did a video. This, this, um, the work we did was in a show at the Walters, and so we had to do a documentary some of you may have seen the map show that was at the Walters in um, Baltimore about five years ago. And then the Washington Post did a Sunday um, magazine article on the work that we did and Don Hawkins has done. And so we have a video here. And if you want to switch, I'm the guy from Baltimore that caused all havoc this morning because I want to show a website. Um, and I really appreciate all the work that everybody had to do. So let me hit this. So this has sound on it, and it's available online. And let me. It appears to be going. I'm just going to talk over it, and it, hopefully all the hitches will get out. So this is um, really for a general audience. That's sort of the work that we try to do, um, not for as sophisticated audience as you. But um, this is a great shot that brings people up to speed on just how much Washington has changed. That was the current terrain um, using map pins, and this is Don Hawkins' incredibly instrumental um, topo map of Washington, D.C. in 1790. And it is on a 3D terrain. So this begins to show your normal person that the Lincoln Memorial is out. Um, and then you're all aware of this. This is a uh, Krantz painting, but there was very few paintings done at the time. And it's incredibly difficult to determine what is accurate and what is not accurate. Um, was the bluff really that steep? Maybe it was. Um, we all know this shot from Georgetown, and we know that that's not the way Washington, D.C. looks like. Um, it's like we're up in the Blue Ridge Parkway. <laughs> so there was a lot of exaggeration. Photography was not um, invented at that point, um, and nobody lived there. Artists had no reason to be living in Georgetown. They were all in Baltimore and Philadelphia and Boston. Um, and the maps at the time were these kind of maps that we've been seeing for a day. They're clean, they're beautiful, they're precise. Um, you want to move there. Um, but that's not the way it looked at the time. This is the, obviously the, de the development plan. So we had to create a base map. And this is really built off of Don Hawkins' 1800 map. But this is a base map for 1810, which is where we were going to be starting. And you can see that there's a yellow pin there at Q4. And we, on this base map, we have a huge amount of um, images. And we have aligned them as to where we think the artist stood. And thanks to Pamela Scott for tracking this down at the Library of Congress. This is a sketch by Reuben Smith. Right. Um, and what's interesting are these two buildings out front. And they don't appear on a king plat. Um, so when were they built? Why are they there? Um, so this was a huge resource. This is Peter Chirico's work. And he spent four years and digitized and made a digital elevation model of all of DC um, using 1888 topo data, um, which is actually pretty accurate, except for around the mall area where most of the development. This is Don's 1790 map mapped on top of it. You can see the topo lines aren't perfect. That's because we haven't gone in and adjusted things yet. But 
trying to get the lay of the land is incredibly difficult. Um, surveyors use different techniques. Um, this is sort of an, a, a way to describe um, an earlier system for how they did cross sections. They didn't do contour lines. But this is Latrobe trying to landscape around the capital, and he needed to know where the dirt was and where he wanted to have the dirt. So he has done these sort of cross sections, and then somehow you have to use a computer or you throw a tablecloth over top some cardboard um, to, to scale the topography. So there's all this, this data is out there, and um, we took advantage of it. Washington, D.C., everything you see is usually scaled dramatically. Even Latrobe scaled it three times. And this is our favorite part. We call this the monopoly building phase. Um, we make little monopoly buildings, sort of roughly the same size, and we start placing them on the landscape. This is a sketch by Latrobe. It, he knew perspective. We knew where he's standing, and it's absolutely accurate. But these two buildings that he sort of stuck in the corner, we're really interested in them. And we're sort of using a triangulation method right now. Um, and we're flying from where Latrobe stood um, down to another well-known picture of Washington, D.C. And we're just sort of interested as to could those actually be the same buildings and maybe we could actually sort of figure out where they sat because there's no um, record of them. And, you know, it, we did a, this a couple of times. We would need to be doing this a lot. Again, this is all sort of research, um, uh, a pilot project. This is looking across the mall, and what we've done is we have to raise up the ground where the forests are. We have to, the, the canopy, and this is classic Hollywood special effects. That's a matte painting that is projected onto the landscape beyond the river, but we're getting the muddy Potomac. We've got Long Bridge in, um, and that's actually how Arlington and um, north of Alexandria would have looked according to the maps. And this was our pilot project. This is where we ended up in about 2008, 2009. We're in a helicopter <laughs> up above the Capitol and we're gonna fly down. You can see the Pentagon and this is the current 3D um, world with a current satellite map on it. And again, we're using pins just to help people understand. And now we're gonna start slowly bringing in our base map that is, you have to have to sort of, and you have to have it for the year you want to be working on. Um, and now we'll start bringing in the sky and the horizon, which has all been painted and mapped on accurately. So we're beginning to um, bring in the background. All the maps always have the Potomac blue and it's a sunny day and um, it wasn't that way. We have a few trees on this side. That's over where Not Leung's plantation would have been. And here's the Capitol, as it would have looked. We worked a lot with Bill Allen, who was the architect of the Capitol um, recently. And this is how the Capitol probably would have looked in 1814 when the British arrived. It was not under construction at the moment. Um, and uh, this was really used as a proof of concept to see whether um, we could do this. You can, you can switch back now to the PowerPoint, please. So that was, um, that was phase one. And um, we took a lot of liberties when you're doing special effects kind of work. You know, who cares whether something's 20 feet out of whack or whatever. Um, but I got hooked. I really got hooked on this. And um, why did I get hooked? And I just jotted a few things down. I still can't believe that nobody has done this. I mean, I, I, go, I do the, these conferences, and I'm just waiting for someone to come up and say, you know, you know, so-and-so in his garage has the whole thing done. Or the university of the planet has had four research professors and 85 graduate students working on this for a century. Um, uh, the other thing is, is that I, I'm, you know, it's, I enjoy people, I enjoy working with people. Um, the people on this project have been very sharing and I'm sort of the aggregator and I get to um, work with them and try to um, bring to life work that they have done. That's been fun. And I'm also very attracted to that time period. I think it's a time period we're not that familiar with because photography wasn't around. Um, what did it look like? Government was the size of a man and a horse, as opposed to these huge granite buildings out there. Um, democracy was new. We were learning our ways, and the city was mud. Um, and also, there's some great stories out there, really good stories. 
Um, if, if you haven't read The Fiery Trial, uh, that's a thick book, but that's a great book to read. Um, it's a, just a wonderful time, um, and it would be great to have a, a, a stage to be able to tell these stories on, and I think actually walking around the landscape would, would tell a lot of interesting stories at that time. Accuracy. You guys will get this picture. This is um, John Adams. $82 million budget. Um, David McCullough wrote it. This is the end of the second last episode. John Adams just locked, lost the election. It's 1802, and he's on this morose, sad, rainy day journey back to Massachusetts because he lost. And he goes in front of the Capitol. Well, that's not the Capitol in 1802 at all, OK? Um, and I love this picture because, A, did they really blow it? Maybe they did. And actually, I don't want to know the answer. If you know the answer, don't tell me, because I love to speculate about this. Um, did some intern, or they were in a hurry, and they just painted this picture quick, and they grabbed a Civil War era. You can actually find the Civil War era picture of the Capitol. They just painted it. Um, but I would also like to suggest that the truth is stranger than fiction. This is actually how it looked, and no one would have believed that that was the Capitol. They wouldn't have gotten this shot. You know, it's all sad, it's gray, the, the country's being built, he lost, he's headed home, um, and he drives in front of that? No one's going to know what that is. <laughs> but that's the, that's the capital, and I think this is what's so interesting about this time period is that we're really not that um, connected with it, and um, truth is stranger than fiction. The other thing is, I just throw this in, I go the other way too. I play video games. This is done by Bethesda Softworks. This is Fallout 3. It's the year 2277, so it's 200 years in the future. I was just looking at 200 years in the back. And it's interesting to look at how they decided to depict Washington, D.C. in a post-apocalyptic world. So phase two begins. And what did we want to do? Um, you can see Don Hawkins here working with a student a uh, recent graduate we hired at the time who knows, knows GIS. And we really wanted to use GIS techniques to get it right, but also GIS um, allows you to work databases that are map-based. Um, we wanted to geo-reference, really geo-reference, all the maps that um, are available. And <laughs> we wanted to do an accurate digital elevation model of the full 100 square miles of um, DC in 1790. And we wanted to recreate a second test area to try out some things. Um, we had the capital done, and we wanted to pick another area. And then we wanted to do location-aware display. That's cell phone stuff, where it knows where you're standing, and you can bring in images for that. Um, so we went back to Peter Chirico's with a huge database um, of uh, most of DC, not Virginia, um, from 1888, and the first step is to erase all man-made features. And it's actually fairly easy in most places. R erasing a road is pretty straightforward. But here is a reservoir that had to be removed. Um, you can see in the 1888 where it is. And then Lindsay, with Don and Peter's help, had to figure out how the lay of the land would have been once the dam was removed. So um, the data from 1888, the later surveys are much more accurate, but there's development. So you're always playing this game of, do I want to go with accuracy in the 1920s um, and then remove development, or do I want to go back to an early um, map? Uh, Peter or Don is always telling these stories. Chaz would get it that, you know, it's 1860, there's mosquitoes, it's hot, it's 95 degrees, you're in a wool suit, and you're supposed to go out across the swamp and with a chain and a pole and survey. <laughs> They, they took a lot of liberties, is what I've heard. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a trade-off trying to decide um, who to work for, um, I mean, what, what, what reference to use. Um, then, you know, there hadn't been much development um, by um, the Civil War, except for the downtown area. And this is where we cut in all the work that Don Hawkins had done. Um, so. Uh, we used his topography and merged that in with um, the 1880. And then we had to do Virginia. Um, Virginia had never been done, and we had to start from scratch. And this is a sketch that Don did, but um, we didn't actually use this drawing. Um, Don told us not to use this drawing. He wanted to use a 1920 drawing. But um, just to show you what had to be done, um, Lindsay had to trace every one of those lines 
and then tell the computer what height that line is above sea level. That's how you digitize and create a digital elevation model. That's probably why this hasn't been done. Um, so uh, Lindsay spent a year working on this whole project. Um, once we had this in, we're able to start geo-referencing, and this is, uh, this is what Patrick showed yesterday. Um, these are all the King Platt surveys that are geo-referenced, and um, there's a few houses that we wished we had um, that no one seems to be able to find. David Burns' house, if anybody can find David Burns' house, I'll take you out for a nice dinner. We need the survey plat of David Burns' plantation. And this is it, um, and this isn't a map. I mean, it looks like a map, and it's pretty, but this is the front end of a database that's actually um, ready to go, and we're excited about it, but this is the whole 100 square miles of the DC Triangle in 1790. It includes bathymetric information um, uh, at that time period. How accurate is it? I'd say it's really accurate for an engineer. It's probably not accurate enough. Um, but on top of this, you can start laying other things. You, also, you can um, put in uh, all the maps. Um, this is property owners. I'm just zoomed in here a couple. So it, it, you're able to start bringing in um, different things. We've laid out the blocks. Each block is named. This is like, so you could go to 362, and um, it's like an Excel spreadsheet. You can, you can start focusing in on every little block. Um, this is Don's 1800 map on top of blocks, um, on top of the uh, 1790 terrain. There's Lef one of LaFrance's plans. We geo-referenced all of them. So there's been a, a huge amount of work uh, to do this, and this was really the, the first step. We wanted to do it, do it right, and we wanted to be able to create a database that, um, actually, do I have one more? No. Let's go back one. Can't really see, I'll do it on this one. Um, every house is actually a separate entity in a database and we've measured the footprint because on most of the um, King Platts it tells you the size of the house or you can measure them. So um, we have an ability to dial up 1790 and we did Alexandria, um, thanks to some historical work that Alexandria did. Um, Georgetown's a little more difficult but we attempted Georgetown with the houses that were there in 1790. So each house is separately um, a data point. We don't have the information to put it in there, but we wanted to create something that all that data can hang on should money fall out of the ceiling one day. Um, so the second test um, area that we want to do is Notley Young's plantation for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, one is you can see Notley Young's plantation from any place in DC. Um, so you know, as we're playing around with camera angles, we wanted to um, work with that. Also, if you're at Notley Young's plantation, you could see any part of DC. So it's centrally located. Um, there's also, you know, he was the largest slave owner. Um, he had the largest plantation, and uh, he was. Uh, there's some interesting stories about him being Catholic and having a chapel, and where is the chapel? can find this all on the website we've done. I'll get into it a little bit. Um, Patrick showed these yesterday. There are two King Survey plats. Patrick didn't tell you that they don't line up. Um, the one on top of the other, uh, different surveyors did it, so which one's right? We ended up using this one. Um, and I can't use a laser pointer, but you can see the big red square. That's the mansion. And if you look north, if you look straight up, you'll see a little blue dot and that is called the Coach House. So um, this is where I begin in my naivete to start being a scholar, watch out. Um, and, and I'm saying that's gotta be the driveway. This is a classic plantation. The big driveway's coming down. You can see at the north um, west corner of the house, you can see um, the beginning of a fence. And so I just made the determination that um, this is probably a classic plantation, and the driveway is coming up through a row of double trees. Um, and you had the coach house off to the side. As you came up, you'll see a map. Um, these are the, shows you the names of the houses, how, uh, their footprint size, not much else beyond that. Worked with John Vlatch a good bit um, because he really knows plantations. Here is um, the base map that is either way off or 
someplace, but this is the base map we used. Um, a lot of tobacco fields, sort of trying to um, guess where the roads might have been. There's the coach house and the driveway going into the coach house, and there's the uh, um, long driveway. Uh, the wharf, he had a wharf further to the right that you can't, that's not on this particular map. Then we do a lot of modeling, and everybody gets excited about this because we've made lots of mistakes. Um, because we are not architecture historians, but it's really clear that any, you know, once we have the information, it can be done. Um, and also, we'll never be this close to these kinds of buildings. Um, and so we can't argue about what kind of doorknob or what kind of munions the windows had. Um, and then, ooh, let's see if this works. Ah. Um, I learned, I, I won't waste your time. So this is, <laughs> this is textured. Um, and this is a pan down of um, the plantation with the fields in, the sky, the trees. Um, we're floating about 100 feet out above the Potomac River. Um, you can see some trees in the foreground. Those are the slave quarters down at this end. Um, if I go back, can we see it again? Um, so you can really see that in these kind of shots, what kind of doorknob is needed is not really that critical. But um, we're guessing, you know, we know where the graveyards are. We're assuming there's trees around the graveyards. You know, we're trying to make ed educated guesses, and we're working with people who um, are happy to volunteer their time as we are volunteering our time. Um, and then uh, we wanted to be able to position it in the current D.C. landscape. So let me leave this up here for a second. It's a little complicated. Um, what you're looking at on the big map is Google Maps, and you can see 395, and I can't wave my mouse or um, laser pointer. Um, but this is, Notley Young's plantation is right where Banneker Park is, the LaFont Plaza and Banneker Park. Um, it's right on the, the shore down below south would be Potomac Park. Jefferson Memorial's a little bit to the, um, to the west. You're ready to go across the bridge there. So what we have done is positioned Notley Young's plantation on top of a current map, and we just used Google. Um, and now we're picking camera locations. And if you look at the inset, you can see that we've picked three locations. And you have to be careful, because um, we're, we're trying to do elevation, and you don't want to have the camera underground for one of the shots. Um, or you don't, or you need to get the camera up high, and you're also trying to get good angles that might be of interest to um, uh, looking at the 1790 landscape and looking at the contemporary landscape. So uh, we have four there. Uh, we did more than four, but this inset is only showing four. One, two, three, four. And you can see that number four is right at the head of the driveway, right in front of Notley Young's house, and it's right on the street um, that circles around Banneker Park. If you look at number three, we're up on a... Um, walkway that goes across the, uh, is that called the Southeast Expressway? Um, you can walk across there. So I think, okay. So then we go out and we take um, full 360, 180 panoramas from those particular, particular locations. So the top um, is the shot in front of Not Lee Young's house. Um, and I've cropped it down a little bit, but that, that's the whole world all the way around. The left side matches the right side. Um, and you can see, I don't know if you know that part of town, but underneath the sun is the wall where the fountain is in Banneker Park. Um, LaFont Plaza is those big buildings up on the left, excuse me, the right. Um, and then the, the lower picture is Notley Young's plantation from the exact same spot um, on the driveway coming in. And the trees look like they're um, because it's it's warped, it's 360 degrees unwrapped. Um, they're actually going down the driveway behind you. And then what we did is um, <laughs> we uh, wanted to do a location aware program, and we had the individual to do this. This is two years ago, by the way, um, which is sort of cutting edge two years ago to do location aware cell phone stuff. Um, but Microsoft came in and scooped him up and he's now making more money than any of us in Redmond. Um, and so we were not able to do the, the iApp at that point. We could do it now, um, but we're on to other things. But so I did a classic then and now, well not classic, but I photoshopped 
uh, picking some of the contemporary world and matching some of the 1790 world. And I'm trying not to take liberties with height uh, that um, actually his house is, is pretty much, uh, they took a lot of land out, but then when they redid LaFont Plaza in the, was that 1950s, 1960s, um, they brought a lot of dirt back in because they had to dig out three, um, the, the Southeast Expressway. So I think we're ready for the finale. Um, before he switches away, Everything I'm showing you and talking about is on this website. It's sort of a blog kind of based website. Haven't done anything in a year on this project. Um, and it, so it's backwards chronological, but it's just visualizingdc.org and you can find all the videos and all the pictures and all the notes. Um, and you can get links to the articles that have been written on this and a paper that I wrote that was um, published in the portal. And so there's, there's you know, we're very open source about this and we self-publish, basically. We're trying to get people involved. So feel free to use this. And if you want to switch, oh, it went to sleep. I'm worried. Oh, no. We got it. So let me get this microphone. I have to work the mouse. All right. Um, you can get these links off the website, but it's a, a great little program website called 360cities.net. It's actually based out of Europe. Um, and let me, what else do we have here? Let's pick a simple one to begin with. Let's pick this guy. And we'll see how fast this was taking a while. We may end up being here a little bit. Um, we may end up being here so long that I won't do it. Oh, good, good. We're coming. So I'm almost done. Um, so let me make this full screen. So here is a panorama. You see these all the time. And this is um, the Southeast Expressway and the La Font. And you're able to move around. What's cool is there's a little map function here. And it shows you what direction you're looking. And so I can move this around. And now we're looking north. All right. And then as you zoom in and out, your frustrum changes as well. All right, so this was a, um, one of the current ones, and let me exit full screen, and let me delete this and go back to this guy. So here is, I'm only gonna show one, there's about six there, and you can have fun with it later on. Um, here is the, the mixed panorama, all right? So you have cars going through his plantation, and here's the driveway, my hypothetical driveway, and I would love for people to come up and say that I'm totally out of whack. I like to do these conferences because I always meet people who have done, and this is, this is the way that knowledge is um, expanded by sharing it. And open up the map and you can, once again, you're seeing where you're standing. And these other blue dots are other shots that we took. And I will do one more. We'll see how fast it comes up. I'll get up high on the expressway. Oh, look at that. It came pretty fast. So close the map. Um, so we are up on the expressway. You can see where we are. We're headed over. Okay, here's, by the way, if, if you're there and you want a good sandwich, go down in there. Um, uh, but, you know, the, there's Water Avenue. And here's Notley Young all laid out down below. And here's the LaFont Plaza. So thank you very much. Our next speaker will be talking about from maps to apps, visitor orientation. We're, we're going to do questions and answers at the conclusion of the three sessions. Can you hold till then? Okay. From maps to apps, visitor orientation at the National Mall. Tom Patterson is senior cartographer with the National Park Services Harpers Ferry Center. He has degrees in geography from the State University of New York at Oneonta and the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Tom previously worked as cartographic laboratory manager and adjunct assistant professor at the University of Utah. 
and a map pro procurement officer focusing on the collection of East Asian and Pacific maps for the U.S. Department of State. Tom now oversees map projects aimed at park visitors and created for different media, including print publications, outdoor signs, visitor center exhib exhibits, electronic kiosks, and web maps. His most recent projects are mobile applications of urban parks in Washington and Boston. But cartographic relief presentation is the cornerstone of Tom's research interests. He maintains the shadedrelief.com website, which offers articles, data sets, wall maps, and tutorials on this topic. And recently, he co-launched shadedreliefarchive.com, a website preserving manual shaded relief created in the 20th century by various international artists. Another recent project was co-developing the nat natural earth projection, a pseudo-cylindrical projection for world physical mapping. Tom is a former president of the North American Cartographic Information Society and is active in the International Cartographic Association's Commission on Mountain Cartography. Please welcome Tom Patterson. Thank you, Roberta, and good morning, everyone. Um, well, it's very uh, pleasing for me as a cartographer, actually, to be speaking to a mapping conference where I don't think too many cartographers are in attendance. Um, what I'm going to be doing um, today is talking about a, a bit of a um, stretch assignment for me. Uh, my career has spanned uh, cartography from the manual era, using pen and ink, scribers, photolithographic techniques. And now I'm engaged in um, making maps for, well, gizmos, uh, uh, iPhones, Android devices, all these, uh, these, these type of uh, mobile applications. And what I want to do today is, is, is share some of my experiences in the app making world. Uh, but before I start on that, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, where I work. I work for the um, National Park Service Harpers Ferry Center. It's one of two uh, service centers in the National Park Service. We're out in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, about 50 miles uh, west of here. And it's a, it's a pretty unique facility. Uh, what Harpers Ferry uh, Center does is it creates all of the interpretive media for all of the national parks. There's 397 units uh, scattered from uh, the Virgin Islands all the way out to Guam and from American Samoa up to um, Arctic Alaska. We're stewards of a, a, ver a rather large um, swath of uh, territory. And when I say interpretive media, what, what we're talking here is the, the content that visitors consume when they go to a park. You know, that would include uh, publications, our famous brochures, uh, when you go to a visitor center, the exhibits that you see there, uh, uh, not only wall displays, but uh, models and also uh, now uh, kiosks. Uh, we create wayside exhibits, and what might you ask are waysides? They're the outdoor signboards that you see when you're strolling around a, a park landscape. We like to call that captioning the landscape. And uh, also at Harpers Ferry Center, um, there's a, uh, we, we administer the National Park Service um, sign program. So when you go out to a park and see you know, uh, directional signs and so forth, uh, we set the standards there. And Eliza and Susan in their presentation next will be um, talking more uh, about uh, that. So we, we have all this, uh, this various media that we, uh, that, that we work with there. And what does all of this have in, in common? Well, maps, and, and that's why I'm here to, to talk to you today. And, and of course, when you think of a National Park Service map, I, th I think most people you know, automatically think about you know, crown jewel natural parks out west or in Alaska. Um, and like this map of uh, uh, Glacier, National, Glacier Bay National Park, uh, Alaska. But the truth is, uh, of the 397 units, uh, the, the vast majority are on the East Coast, uh, often in, in urban centers. They're uh, cultural and historical in nature. And uh, speaking as a cartographer, I find uh, preparing visitor maps of, of urban parks to be much more of a challenge than mapping the glaciers of Glacier Bay National Park. People go there on cruise ships, drink their Mai Tais, and look at the scenery. Um, people in Washington, D.C., of course, are uh, uh, setting off on foot um, and, and having to discover things uh, by themselves. 
they don't have a cruise ship captain telling them where to go. So um, before I start talking about the National Mall app, I just wanted to uh, establish a little bit of a, a benchmark uh, uh, from the perspective of Harpers Ferry Center mapping for visitors on the National Mall. And, and for us in my office, uh, this map, this first map that I'm showing you uh, is uh, from 1966. This is deep history for us cartographically. Um, and, and of course, uh, you know, this would be a free uh, printed map for, uh, given to people to, to get around uh, uh, the National Mall and, and Washington, D.C. Uh, this is kind of elaborate at that time. It's, it's a two-color map. And you know, I think it's probably served its uh, function fairly well. One issue I have with this map, and, and this, is, this is one of my uh, pet peeves, when you're in an urban park uh, trying to identify uh, buildings, where you are, uh, wayfinding, one of the problems are buildings represented by just footprints. And uh, you know you see you see this rectangular shape on a map. You know what does this really represent? I mean, for example, the, uh, the, the Washington Monument. If you were looking at that on a uh, on a planometric map, would just be a tiny uh, square. When in fact we know it's a very tall uh, needle. So this is uh, 1966. The next map I'm going to show you is from uh, uh, circa 1970. There's a a building uh, toward kind of in the uh, top center left. It's, it's uh, abbreviated NCFN. Uh, watch what happens when I go to this next slide. Did you see that? The, the building shifted one block east. There, there's, a le there's a lesson to be learned here. Either the, this organization had a change of venue or uh, someone goofed when making the original map, uh, and this was a correction. So uh, don't trust what you read on National Park Service maps, I guess. <laughs> okay, 1970, woo, we're going to three color printing uh, at this point in time. This is the, uh, the venerable uh, Welcome to Washington uh, map series. You can see the, the brochure cover on the, uh, the left side of the screen and the map on the right, of course. So that's uh, 1970. Big changes happened uh, uh, next. Uh, with the bicentennial, a series of what we called MIDI folders were uh, produced. Uh, they're notable for going to four-color printing. Uh, you can see that you know, fancy uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, starburst uh, you know, cover on it. Uh, but look at the, uh, the, the buildings themselves. They're no longer those dreaded uh, rectangular footprints, but we actually have exonometric uh, 3D buildings that uh, give people cues about what these buildings actually look like. And I, uh, I give the, uh, the de developers of this a real shout out for doing that. In fact, uh, these, um, this, this map was made by R.R. Donnelly Cartographic Services, uh, now known as MapQuest up in Lancaster, uh, Pennsylvania. They were a, uh, one of our long-term cartographic uh, contractors. Okay, and then um, last um, but not least, this is the, the current uh, brochure map of Washington. It's, uh, it's, it's more or less the same map that uh, R.R. Donnelly created. It's now uh, digitized. You'll notice one thing, that the, uh, not all the buildings are 3D anymore, just the, the key uh, uh, structures, the Washington Monument, the Capitol, uh, the White House, et cetera. And, and this was partially done because the map was getting more cluttered with stuff. You know, Each revision, the park would say, hey, we need to show this, 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 and this. Putting these labels on top of a 3D map um, can prove uh, problematic. So we went back to flat buildings again, much to my uh, chagrin. Uh, by the way, uh, this map is uh, what we call part of the Unigrid program. This was a uh, publications program uh, initiated by New York designer Massimo Vignelli, and it's, it's best known for the, uh, the, the black bands and white titles on, on the brochures. It's all according to a, a grid, standardized paper sizes, and uh, it's, it's very efficient to produce uh, maps and brochures in this, in this manner. Okay. Well, um, several years ago, um, uh, there was initiative to um, change uh, signage on the National Mall. Um, this this uh, program, uh, multi-million dollar program, was to produce 500 uh, new signs on the mall, and they're out there today. Uh, you'll hear about that next. Uh, but there was a little provision in this, uh, in this plan. 
there, the idea was to also explore new media for uh, getting people from point A to point B, orienting them on, on the National Mall. A lot of ideas were thrown around. Uh, one that was uh, out there initially was to have some sort of uh, key, electronic kiosk uh, somewhere on the National Mall with, you know, that was interactive. And of course, the problem with that is, you know, how do you protect that in a uh, uh, in an outdoor situation from the weather? Then there's issues of security, vandalism, and and, and so forth. Uh, what was really nice about this time is um, uh, smartphones were bursting um, onto the scene. Uh, in in particular, the uh, 2007 introduction of the iPhone. And so we decided at that point what we would do instead of putting um, a kiosk out in the middle of the mall is actually develop uh, a mobile application uh, that people could use on their own devices. Okay, um, a little bit about this. <laughs> when we started this, this, this project, uh, the Park Service, being a very egalitarian organization, felt that if we created a mobile app, it had to play on every mobile device out there. And uh, th this was uh, three years ago, and I think there was 7,000 devices that were available at the time. Uh, nevertheless, we, uh, we soldiered on, put out a uh, re request for quotes, and the, um, the, the price tag was astronomical in the millions of dollars to have an app that would play on all these devices. And of course, low-end devices, it wouldn't play on at all. So. Um, it was canceled and we decided to do it again and focus our attention on uh, Apple iOS and that the then emerging uh, Google Android. And that, uh, that uh, did, a, did a really good job of getting the, uh, the price tag um, down. The uh, contracting cost, as you can see, $168,000 for this thing. And when you, um, when you factor in the, uh, the government employee time involved, it was, it was probably about a $200,000 effort. This was uh, not a trifling um, exercise um, for us. And you can see that uh, we, we had a contractor, uh, Wildflower uh, Interactive, they were based in uh, Austin, Texas, and XNR Productions was the uh, cartographer, uh, and they're out in Madison, Wisconsin. Okay, this is our... Um, ambitious schedule, which of course uh, <laughs> did not materialize, <laughs> the best laid plans. <laughs> um, particularly at the, um, the end of the project, uh, there were lots of I's, the dot and T's to cross uh, technically, and uh, the, the deadline slipped. We, we finally got the, uh, the, the version 1.0 of iOS out uh, by July of last year, and it wasn't until October that the Android uh, version um, got out on the street. And uh, then 60 days after that, we, we released the, uh, the update to that. One of the interesting things about National Park Service contracting for this type of media is that these contracts usually are based on a pot of money, and uh, that money is only to create one thing, one widget, so to speak, and once that's delivered, that's the end of the contract. And all, as all of you know, when you develop an app, there's frequent updates to the thing. So what we decided to do is uh, release a 1.0 version, then wait 60 days if any bugs or problems were reported, then come out with a 1.1, and then call it uh, quits. And that's basically what we did. Okay, I threw the slide in here. Um, at, in the National Park Service, these, these terms, these buzzwords that you see right there, are a lot of the in initiatives and things that we discuss a lot, what we try to, you know, um, to do. And this, this, this app that, you know, that uh, runs on a device about the size of, of a deck of cards, uh, to a large extent addresses many of these, these things. It's, it's, it's quite uh, amazing in my estimation. One of the things that was uh, a concern for us was the uh, National Park Service um, identity. Uh, as you can see, the, the icon for the app on, on the left kind of mimics the, uh, the design on our Unigrid uh, brochures, and you can see the, you know, the Park Service arrowhead on the right. One of the things about publishing apps, uh, especially on the iTunes um, <coughs> store, that the, uh, the icon itself could have a name only uh, 11 to 16 characters in uh, length, depending on the width of the letters. So you, if you have a, a, a park with a very long name, it's not going to fit on there. So far, we haven't encountered that problem, but I, I don't know what we're going to do when we have to do the William Jefferson Clinton uh, you know, birthplace, but da, da, da. Uh, it would be a problem. 
This is the, uh, the home screen of the app, and I'm, I'm just going to uh, just quickly go through a, a quick tour of the app. I will say that when we, um, when we uh, created this, we wanted to adhere as closely to Google, Android, and Apple iOS uh, user interface guidelines. We didn't want users of these devices to have to learn how to use a custom interface. So, and that's what we did. Okay, here, you know, here's the overview section. I'll just run through these quickly. Uh, one of the nice things that we have in here is an RS feed, RSS feed to the, uh, the National Mall website that picks up on events and news. So if you want to know what's going on at any time, you'll get a chronological listing of events. It's quite handy. This was something we didn't plan to do in the scope of work, but it was thrown in as a kind of a frivolous little item, and it's proved very popular. You could just use your device to take a picture, it frames it, and then you could just send a digital postcard to your family or friends who don't have the, the luxury of being on the National Mall. And then finally, the Trust for the National Mall was a partner in this, and they, they, um, they contributed uh, half the money for the entire program. So we give them a, a, a well-deserved shout out um, on the app. Okay, finally, I'm getting to the map <laughs> part, part of this. Um, we created a, um, a custom app um, for the, um, the app. It, uh, it uses the Google um, Maps API application programming interface. In other words, our custom map sits on top of the Google map below, which also provides the, the routing directions and so forth. And uh, I will say designing the map for the app was a bit of a challenge. Uh, this is the current brochure map that people get, and, and uh, the park and everyone seems to love. It's quite uh, detailed. Then um, Susan and Eliza are going to be talking about the, uh, the present sign maps. And you can see there's, a, there's, there's a, a bit of a design difference between these, these maps, isn't there? So here we are coming in, and we're trying to create this map for an app. You know, what design do we, uh, do we use? Well, uh, <laughs> I just kind of split things up the middle and, and tried to incorporate, what, cherry pick and incorporate what I thought were the, the best elements of, of both. You'll notice that the, the app map does use uh, 3D uh, buildings, but in moderation, it uh, adapts the kind of brownish color that the, uh, the sign maps have. And, and plus, it's, uh, it's, it's got its, its own um, sort of design elements you know, for someone who's out with a mobile device. Uh, I've never made a map with push pins on it before, for example. Um, one, one of the concerns I had in designing this map was that you know when, if someone's walking around with a mobile device out in the mall, it's it's a pretty uh, open uh, environment, lots of light, glaring light, and you know using a laptop or any mobile device out in in a bright conditions like that, it gets pretty hard to read the screen. It, it washes out. So I I, I, tr I went out of my way to try to build in uh, you know, visual hierarchies, you know, focusing on those points that were uh, most important. This is the uh, extent of the, uh, the map. Uh, this, this app was created primarily for the National Mall and Memorial Parks, which this map almost covers all of. Uh, it, it doesn't quite go to the, uh, the end of Haynes Point, as you could say. But the, it's, it's the east-west axis that was the, the, the key consideration. And plus, of course, any map of, of the National Mall in Washington, D.C., focusing on the tourist core, has to look you know, beyond the National Mall itself and on other adjacent uh, tourist attractions, a museum and a Holocaust Museum and things of that nature. Um, one thing that was a little bit strange about designing this map is that because it, um, it lays on top of Google Maps, it, it had to be in the web Mercator projection, which Google uses. And this is the first time in my career that I've actually made a map in the Mercator projection. It was drummed into us you know, in, in, at university that it was the Mercator projection's evil. Um, uh, uh, but, I, but I will say, at close in scales like this, it really doesn't matter so much what the projection is. OK, there's, um, there's uh, three zoom levels um, to the map. This is uh, most zoomed out. And, and it, this was a real challenge. You know, each zoom level of the map, you're not making a single map of the city. You're, you're making three uh, maps of the city. And they all have, they have to coordinate as you zoom in, which each click of the mouse or tap of the finger, as it would be on your device, you know, more and more detail appears. So. Um, Good, good way of getting lots of information onto the small screen um, of, of a device. 
Um, again, um, talking about legibility, I, I went to great pains to make the labels as clear as possible. I don't know if you can see this um, on your screens uh, in front of you, but uh, all the labels have a very soft sort of halo around them. Barely noticeable, but just makes them a little bit more readable against the, the, the map, the base map uh, below. Okay, uh, I th this is kind of the marquee feature of the app, in my, in my mind. It's, it's, it's called uh, Park Lens. It's uh, augmented uh, reality. Uh, what you can do with this is, when you're out traipsing about the mall, is hold up your device, um, click the uh, Park Lens uh, button, look through it, and labels appear identifying the uh, points of interest, that, uh, the monuments that are around you. Um, and, and this is, um, you know, it's, 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 there's kind of like a cool factor to this, but it's, it's also, you know, quite useful. You know, if you're a visitor and, and don't really know what is in front of you, or you're looking for some more obscure, uh, you know, place, the John Erickson uh, marker or monument or something like that, you can actually find this with this. It'll say, oh, it's over there. It's behind that clump of trees. Invisible, but that's the direction that you have to go to find that. We spent uh, more time and more money getting this feature to work than anything else. Um, it, the, the labels tended to uh, be very jittery on the screen. Getting them to actually align above the, uh, the, the places was, was difficult. When you go out uh, later today and try this on the National Mall, you might notice that there's you know, you know, you know, 10, 15 percent or degrees of fluctuation of where the, the labels you know, actually should be. There's a certain slop factor on this. If there's someone using a, a mobile device standing next to you, that seems to have an influence as well. Um, so uh, be aware of that. A, um, an unexpected um, uh, thing about this, this feature, um, Park Lens, is that uh, it, we went out and was, we were doing some beta testing of it uh, on the mall, and uh, a blind park ranger accompanied us. And he had the app, and he you know, um, had his earbuds in, and he got into Park Lens, and he's, he's just standing there. And he's, he has his finger on the screen. He's in voiceover mode. And as he turned around, uh, everything around him was being identified. And you should have seen the, the, the smile on his face. I mean, for, for he, it was as if he was actually seeing uh, the world around him. And, and this, this really had a, a, a big impact on me. And I, I think that you know, augmented reality has uh, just, just a huge uh, potential for meeting uh, accessibility um, needs. Um, speaking of which, um, this, uh, this app, like all electronic uh, federal um, documents, has to be accessible, uh, uh, and it is, and we went to a lot of effort uh, to audio describe all of the images, caption the videos, uh, and, and also the, um, the maps. If you haven't tried this, uh, if you have an iOS device, if you go into uh, you know, uh, preferences, the general section, there's an ex accessibility uh, button. You could put your app into voiceover mode, and I'm gonna do that right now and give you a little demo. I actually have the, the, the park map in front of me right now. I'm gonna run my finger over it and see, see if I could find something. Oop, a little higher. I, I had to look, I cheated. Vietnam Veterans, Oops. Vietnam Veterans Memorial. So as, as a, a blind user uses this, the, tap. Three of five. they, five. they tap. could uh, double tap and five. go from one place in the app to another and actually navigate, uh, navigate the map uh, in accessibility mode like that, voiceover mode. Uh, it's, it's pretty good, it's not perfect, but uh, you know, typically on these sort of electronic kiosks, uh, we, we dedicate about 20 or 25 percent of the budget to accessibility needs. The fact that iOS has all of this built in really brings the, uh, the, the costs uh, way down. And I'm really excited about this and future uh, developments in this, this area. Okay, uh, a little bit more about the app. Uh, it, it, it has a ton of information in there. We go through, I think there's some 70 uh, park and other sites that are, are listed. Uh, there's, there's galleries of images. Um, and, and probably one of the more popular items are the, uh, the tours. We, um, we have these pre-canned tours. Uh, they're either thematic um, or, or, or based on time. Or if, if a uh, user wants to, they could actually you know, create their own custom tour. 
And uh, what's, what's neat about this is once you uh, get into a tour, uh, again, we're getting into geolocation and using uh, the Google Maps uh, engine we, in pedestrian mode, because this whole app is, is geared toward pedestrian users, uh, you could either see a, a map route going from uh, place to place on the National Mall, or if you prefer, you get uh, list directions. Now, some of the list directions are kind of funny. You know, you know they, they, they might say, walk 12 feet, take a right on sidewalk, walk 15 feet, take a left, and so forth. I don't know how useful those things w would be, especially if you could see the National or the, you know, the Washington Monument right in front of you. I think that might, <laughs> that might be a, a cue. But I've been told some people really like uh, list directions like this. Uh, again, this, this, this thing came out uh, July of last year. It got a lot of attention on the, uh, the iTunes uh, site. Um, um, it, was, it was a staff pick. It was in the new and notable category. Uh, you know, here it is. Yeah. Ignore the, the cold play. We're just below that. And I'm sure that's what most people would be uh, looking at is, you know, <laughs> for, for, um, on this. Uh, in the nine months that the app's been out, it, um, on iTunes, it's been downloaded 51,000 times, and on, on Android Market, it's, it's had 14,000 um, downloads thus far. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's building. And that about uh, wraps it up. Uh, if you have one of these uh, smart devices with you um, now, feel free to go um, download it and, and use it. And uh, be sure to um, go to the, uh, your respective market and give it a very high rating. <laughs> Thank you very much. We have come to the last segment of our session. It's Beyond Maps, Wayfinding education and experiencing the National Mall in the 21st century. We have two speakers. The first, and I'm going to introdu introduce both of the speakers, uh, is Susan Spain, a registered landscape architect since 1982. Susan Spain was a consultant doing public sector planning and design before joining the Denver Service Center of the National Park Service in 1989. Today, she is a National Park Service's National Mall Plan Project Executive. I left my reading glasses back on the chair. Okay, so bear with me. Uh, Susan's work includes planning and design projects at the White House and President's Park, Sequoia National Park, and the War in the Pacific National Historic Park. She has also worked at National Park Units in Arizona, California, Nevada, Alaska, Mississippi, Rhode Island, Missouri, Minnesota, New York, and Washington State. Eliza Voigt is a registered urban planner with the American Institute of Certified Planners, and she holds a master's degree in urban and regional planning from the University of North Carolina. She works on transportation and planning issues for the National Park Service National Mall and Memorial Parks. And prior to joining the National Park Service, she worked in local government as an urban planner and also with the Pennsylvania Avenue Development Corporation. We welcome both of them. I realize you're appearing separately, but we welcome both Eliza and Susan. Tom made a little presentation about working for the Harper's Ferry Center. I am duty stationed in Washington, D.C., but work for the um, Denver Service Center of the National Park Service. That is the facility that deals with design, planning, and construction for all the National Park units. Um, I'm also going to give a little, a little kind of a background about um, the app. Eliza's daughter and my granddaughter did a little trial of the app before it came live. My granddaughter was out for three days in 100 degree heat um, using this app, and Eliza's daughter, who was a preteen, um, came out and joined her. The, they loved it. Um, my granddaughter's favorite component of that was, what's nearby, and how can you set up a tour on your own? And she really liked that. They did have challenges with uh, um, 
walk north 400 feet and then turn and walk 5,000 feet this way because they had no clue what north was. They were teenagers. And they also had problems when they ran into any construction any place. So that was a challenge for them. Um, we're going to be walking through and talking about things that are a little lower tech than the last two presentations. For the last day, we've really heard about how maps kind of helped us visualize the potential, define the boundaries. Now we're going to talk about how maps today help us utilize spaces. And I brought some sample maps that are more of the brochure maps that Tom has traditionally produced that um, talk a little bit more about different kinds of uses and maps. These are all for the National Mall or adjacent areas, but they're a little bit different. Um, we've got maps for during cherry blossom time to really help people find their way around. The typical Park Service map, the Welcome to Washington map, is available here, and I've got lots of copies. I'm throwing things on the ground in back of me. We have a map that is specific to Virginia Avenue, um, and it's really talking about the Statues of Liberators walking tours. So there's some things that are specific to different kinds of uses. First Amendment on the National Mall. We have a little map with sites that are really critical to the First Amendment on the National Mall. So those are the kinds of things that we're doing. We're specifically talking in this program a little bit about um, the new, I've got to figure out which site is forward, the new sign program that we were working on. And um, it has been out for about a year. It has told us a lot about how visitors use things, and we know we need to regularly update signs and maps, but they are well used throughout the area. Um, my task was working on planning for the National Mall. This is basically the study area that we were working with. Boy, it's really hard to see this thing here. So this is the area that we were looking at um, pedestrian maps and guides for. Uh, the National Mall has lots of stuff happening at about the same time. There's so many destinations out with the glasses at this point in time. 25 million visitors a year. That's a lot of people trying to find their way around. And at the same time, we know maps help people, guides help people, and we, have, we may have feedback from the Commission of Fine Arts saying, well, you don't need maps and signs because people can just ask other people where to go. And, and you can imagine how successful that is. <laughs> Believe it or not, there are people who standing right in front of the Washington Monument say, what is that? <laughs> we have a great many foreign visitors, too. They may recognize something as an icon or a symbol of this nation, but not truly understand what it is. Um, when we started this project, we had a lot of people not really understanding what was, where they were, and it's particularly when you're kind of in the spaces between. Right when you're at the Washington Monument or the Lincoln Memorial, you probably, 90% of people know where they are. But other places and how to get between places was the major problem. Uh, we had sign overload, especially when you got close to places. Um, you know, there's a tendency of organizations to kind of tell you how to behave and what to do and to show you things. And that's pretty clear from um, the signs that we had. It was a hodgepodge. It was a mess. Um, we had orientation signs that were not necessarily oriented for how people were looking all the time. The capital was always on the top. Um, these signs were 40 years old. Uh, they did not have memorials on them that people were planning on visiting, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, the Korean War Veterans Memorial, the FDR Memorial. So, and then we put up temporary signs, the wooden post kinds of signs. These signs got worn out very quickly. Um, we knew from National Mall Planning that signs and wayfinding was one of the top five issues that people were concerned about. First thing, didn't look good enough. Second thing was, it is really hard to find my way around here. I don't know where to go. You need to help me do it, and you need to do it now. So we didn't even wait till finishing up the plan to start working on this particular issue, the pedestrian guides and wayfinding. Fortunately, we had kind of the sign program that was in the Harper's Ferry Center 
But we also had a lot of signs within Washington, D.C. that we had to kind of customize the whole system so that it would work together and adapt for this urban environment. Um, kinds of statements we heard from people. All visitors should be made to feel welcome through signs, and this includes maps at the same time. So there were, they wanted us to create a, a pedestrian environment where you could really understand things, where you had maps that showed you where to go. And basically, we ended up with a system of wayfinding uh, maps and directional signs. It's that combination of the need for orientation with maps and the need for guideposts. Head this way. So you can see it is a suite or a family of signs. There are tall pylons. There are four or five different kinds of maps. Some of them are bent at an angle. Some of them are very big vertical uh, maps. They all have the same information on them, but they're oriented two different ways. If you are standing and looking to the north, it is oriented so you can see exactly what is happening in, in the direction you'd be looking. If you're looking from the south, it would be the exact opposite. Eliza's going to talk a little more about the signs and details when we get a little farther along. So you can see the kinds of things that we have. At what we consider our welcome center, which is the Smithsonian Metro stop, where maybe 60% of the visitors come through Metro, we have a very large sign, probably 20 feet long, and it's double-sided. People are always there. They're touching the signs constantly. In addition to the signs, there's, a do there's other information. Liza will show you a little more, talk a little bit about that as we go through. But you can see that there's a wide variety of sizes of maps. And they're sized for different areas. They're kind of a perimeter system to catch you when you come through. This combination of the pylons, tall ones, and shorter ones give you different levels of information. And um, you catch them early on, you get the rhythm of it, you start to see, well, I should be expecting more information. I know there's a map coming up here, this kind of thing. So um, there's a variety of sizes. When you get to the smaller pylons with the little arrow on it, it's more the stuff that's nearby. That'll tell you about toilets and food. It'll also tell you about a nearby memorial. The larger ones, it's this way to the big deals, okay? This way to the Lincoln Memorial, this way to Arlington Cemetery, this way to the Capitol, those kinds of things. You can see the, the size of the maps. The, the map on the left-hand side from your view is one that is angled, so you can look down at it. Um, I, I want Eliza to talk to you about the types of materials we used on the maps, too. But the maps are providing the overall context. And recognizing that we're within Washington, D.C., within an urban area, we don't have maps that are simply National Mall. It goes way beyond the National Mall. Sometimes around here you'll find maps that might be maps for the Library of Congress. And you'll see their buildings only and not too much context. The same thing happens with, this, with the Smithsonian and maybe um, the architect of the Capitol or the Botanic Grounds. Our maps were intended to help people feel like they were understanding the entire Washington, D.C. central core visitor experience. Um, there are also other kinds of maps that people might have access to, and we just showed you a couple of bicycle maps that are available online that you can find from various groups. We also have a map on the lower right-hand side that shows um, where you have ball fields on the National Mall. Uh, multi-purpose field. So there's, there's a variety and maps are kind of layered. That's some real opportunities for us as we move forward too with the kind of um, map apps that are coming. Uh, let's see, which way is this? This is from the south. Um, all of the maps are a bird's eye view and as Tom pointed out, not everything is in three dimension. The, the big five plus one the big five meaning Jefferson, Lincoln, Washington Monument, White House, and the Capitol, plus one meaning the Smithsonian Castle. Those were the ones that were identified within here. And basically the green is the open space in Washington, D.C. There's a little map on the lower right that does show you um, distances. 
and it might tell you the amount of time it takes to get there. You'll see that there's international symbols on here, and we also have the metro stops highly um, identified on here. Big thing, how much information do you put on these? What is too much? And um, so that gets talked about all the time. Now this is from the opposite viewpoint. This is you're standing on the north side looking south and the orientation flips around, these um, orthographic images of the buildings flip around, but it's the same things going on. And it really helps you get um, someplace that, uh, uh, when you're moving around the city, you'll also see that there's QR codes on the maps, and that's just coming in at this point in time. Eliza will be talking about that. And we have some maps that went down to Haynes Point, and that's because it's locally used for recreation. Technically not right on the National Mall, but it was part of the sign system as we were going forward. Eliza, come and take over. Hello, everyone. I'm Eliza Voigt. Um, I'm an urban planner. I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, urban planner with the National Park Service, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what you see when you're on the ground. You're the person on the ground, and really, it's a beautiful day, and it would be a good opportunity if we could all walk around and use these signs because it would be this is this would be a good starting point. It's kind of the end. As a matter of fact, I think. Um, whoops! You can see if I had a pointer. We are on the building we're on now. Hmm. There is a pointer. Oh. <laughs> well, this is better yet. The building where we are now is on this map. So here we are at the Library of Congress. And uh, in this case, it's a north-oriented north map. And what I like about these maps is when we were walking back to our office yesterday, um, we looked up and there was the Capitol. In this map, if I was a visitor, I would see, oh, there's the Capitol. There I am right now at the Library of Congress, and there is the uh, Capitol. I know which way I'm going. So, um, and as Susan said, the QR codes, we haven't even changed these maps out. This summer we're going to put the QR codes on the maps and have a direct link to Tom's app. So the person will be able to be at the mall, um, get around, and then also refer to their app uh, if they'd like. Um, so we've seen these. Now here what we did, um, and this is actually the back of the, one of the back of the large maps that are on the perimeters of the mall. So again, when you enter the mall, you'll see these large maps, they're double-sided. Um, they're photographs. This is when it, the, the uh, sign was being made, and we were determining what photographs and what sites to put on this. Like the app, we also have plan your visit. We have thematic tours. Um, specifically tours that will help a family, tours that will, for the first time visitor, uh, most popular, overlook gems if you're coming back. So we really try to group um, and uh, help people with specific topics. So the maps here are more than just maps. They're maps and information, although the map signs, the map is large and big. And as Susan said, if you walk around the mall, everyone is touching these maps. They're, <laughs> they're not looking at them. They stand in groups, and they all touch them. So uh, we made them in high-pressure laminate material. Um, and hopefully they'll last. Although, you know, we've had to make some changes to the maps already. For instance, Martin Luther King came in, um, the memorial, not Martin Luther King, the Martin Luther King Memorial, um, a new addition to the National Mall, and we, had to, we updated the maps already within the past year. So again, these have to be flexible. Um, as new uh, destinations come in, we want to keep them current because as we've found a map that's not current is not useful for our visitors. Um, Another addition is uh, what we introduced um, earlier, the pedestrian, what we call the pedestrian pylons. And they're really the trail markers for the pedestrian. And all the signs we've done are pedestrian signs. They're not vehicular signs. At some point, we'll look at vehicular signs. But at this point, it's all about the pedestrian. It's all about their experience walking on the mall. Um, these directional pylons are after you've oriented yourself to the map. They're part of the system. They're part of the rhythm. You enter in, you find your map, and then uh, you decide what you want to do. And you walk and you see these directional pylons. And they really are systematic uh, because there's only at, there's four tiles um, 
on both, on both the large pylons and the smaller pylons. The large pylons are about eight or nine feet. They're porcelain tiles. Um, they can sl slide in and out. You just remove the top and you can slide these uh, pylons in and out. Um, the tall ones are for the for the farther destinations, and Susan said, the arrow will direct you the top the highest pylon is the closest destination. And then it's the next and the next. And some of the large pylons um, have some written words that that's coming up, that these type of things are coming up. Um, uh, so, and then again, the smaller pylons are when you get to your destination, what's in the surrounding area, visitor facilities, bathrooms, et cetera. Oh, they are four-sided pylons, so you can hit from either direction. So they'll all there. So there are four tiles, but there's really 16 tiles on each side. So they're usually at intersections, right angles. You come, so you can look at for all four sides and see which way you're going. And these are um, are the graphic imagery on the pylons. These are the tiles that we've developed so far. Um, you can see there uh, all the. Uh, destinations. I too need glasses. <laughs> Lincoln Memorial, FDR, World War II. We wa worked with the stakeholders, the Smithsonian, anyone else uh, who would be involved and worked what they worked with them to determine what they thought the icon would best fit their facility. Martin Luther King, again, was a very new icon. Uh, we developed it over the past uh, year or less than a year and uh, worked with them to determine what they would like to see on their icon. And these are international symbols. We talked a lot about how we have a lot of international visitors to this city. And should we put these signs, these maps, should we put them in different languages? What languages would we use? And we had determined the best thing. Let's develop a single icon for the destinations, for the facilities, and take it from there. So that was probably a pretty good decision. <laughs> um, this just shows you uh, on this streetscape, what you would see as you walk up to the pylon. Again, there was a lot of discussion about what would fit best with the environment, uh, what would not stand out too much, but what could the pedestrian see, what would they be comfortable walking up to, and how to direct them. Even these are touched by all the pedestrians. You would think that they're kind of walking by them. They stand there and they touch them. So uh, above the street furniture, under the trees, at the intersections is what we tried to do. And this just summarizes it. Um, it's unified elements. Uh, this, uh, they're placed at the perimeters. The map kiosks orient you. The pylons um, are your trailblazers. This location here, if you can recognize it, is at um, Independence and 23rd. You're south of the uh, Lincoln Memorial. So if you are standing there, what you may see on that pylon would be possibly the top one would be what? What's ahead of you? The Lincoln Memorial. And then underneath could possibly, um, you know, I probably should have looked to see exactly what this is, but I would suspect it's uh, Korean Memorial or Vietnam Veterans Memorial. And what will happen, so that will direct you straight ahead. And there'll be other tiles on the other side. So if you're walking south, um, it could be uh, the FDR Memorial, or we may have changed it. We've already altered these, since they are so flexible, to point you down to the Martin Luther King Memorial, since now that is what visitors are asking most, where is Martin Luther King? So, um, so straight ahead, you would see those. And as you go up to the next corner, there's another pylon. So Lincoln would drop off, because Lincoln's ahead of you. And then next, it might point you towards uh, Korea or Vietnam. And so that's the way it goes. Let's see. And then, oh, and as uh, we early, we've, we've just recently added the QR codes. These maps have not been installed. They will be installed soon. Um, something else we thought was important, at the Smithsonian Metro stop, which is located on the National Mall, we created a, a, a larger-than-life sign um, with larger-than-life text next to it. Um, and that's kind of, it, we, we foresee that to be a, a visitor kind of area, a, a welcome center to the Washington Mall. Uh, to the National Mall, and we've been, there are benches and a place to rest because most of our visitors we're hoping will come by public transit, and then maybe there'll be some further additions in the future for the visitor there. And then Susan will uh, t talk about the future.
not only is the stuff that Tom's been working on part of the, you know, the app, but we've been working with um, consultants, educational consultants, on a whole variety of things that can be part of a map and an app um, type of a thing. Uh, scrapbooking. So kids can be doing scrapbooking their, their whole trip. Um, even flash mob types of things where you can get people together and at one point in time there will be a flash mob notice that we're all saying the Gettysburg Address together. And so you'll hear that across or a time when everyone says freedom or, you know, just some things like this to help connect people so that they understand what this place means. We've heard earlier this week that this place was designed to be a national capital. Well, part of that is um, what we're dealing with now is what does that national capital mean? What is that identity of your nation? What does that mean in terms of the pilgrimage um, site for an American where they're coming to find out what it means to be an American or visitors who are coming to do that? So part of the sign system, the educational system, will be layered. Um, it's highly likely that you will be able to find, um, if you're at the lockkeeper's house, you might see a series of maps that you'd be able to see looking back over time with this particular site and what it looked like, or when, where it moved from various points in time. So those are the kinds of things that will happen um, with educational programs in the future. Most of these mapping things we do not see as something that ends up in an archive anyplace because they're constantly changing. Um, they've got to constantly adapt and evolve to what the types of uses are. But it would be really interesting, not only um, what we're doing now is listing the major events that we do on the National Mall, but to be able to hold up your phone or something and say, what's happening here? This is a First Amendment demonstration related to XYZ. Or this is the Library of Congress Book Festival. Um, you know, so you can find out about that and then see the whole schedule. Right now, we're, we're kind of telling these are the ranger programs that we've got going on, this kind of thing. Uh, Tom mentioned that this was um, funded um, partially by the Trust for the National Mall. We're very grateful. It was a centennial initiative project of the last administration. The National Park Service is turning 100 in 2016. And so that um, not only would this system help people, but the trust is working with us on a number of projects, including a design competition that we just completed to get some things done and make some changes on the National Mall by the, uh, the centennial. I think that's what we had. I'm going to ask our speakers for ses session number five to please come up to the stage and to remind you all that this event is being videotaped for subsequent broadcast on the library's website and other media. The audience is encouraged to offer comments and raise questions during the formal question and answer period, but please be advised that your voice and or image may be recorded and later broadcast as part of the event. By participating in the question and answer period, you are consenting to the library's possible reproduction and transmission of your remarks. Now, we do have uh, microphones, and so that everybody can hear, I'm going to ask you when you um, are asked when you want to ask a question to wait until one of our staff with the microphones can get close to you. So do we have any questions? I think, Dick, you had a question uh, after the first presentation. So uh, John, John, John Monagle, Dick, do you have a question that you want to ask? Because you were the first to ask. I didn't get the code for the, um, that, that uh, Dan Bailey was talking about for a, a umbc.map, is that the one we can use to get what you were showing? No, it's, it's um, visualizingdc.org. Visualizingdc.org. Yep. Okay, thank you. That was Visualizingdc, easy. one word, dot org. Thank you very much. Do we have other questions, Dick? Uh, uh, John, would you come up here? Uh, Dick has a question. He's next. Uh, just to, out of curiosity, um, 
when you're putting signs on the mall in the vicinity, do you have to ask the uh, Fine Arts Commission uh, for permission? The Fine Arts Commission, we worked with them to um, prepare the whole system. Originally, the idea with the pylons where they were going to be color-coded. So things that related to government were a solid color, were, were blue. Art museums were yellow. Um, landscape places were green in terms of the background with the pylons. But we have kind of a mousy gray colored everything. Um, <laughs> it, it matches kind of tree bark. Um, but the pictograms are white. They stick out. We are very nice and subtle. Mm -hmm. But yes, you do have to go through the Commission of Fine Arts. I was just curious. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. One other comment about that, that we did want to um, have uh, what we call identification names for, for some of the monuments. And I think through the process that yeah, got that removed because they, uh, some of the commissions felt that everyone knew what all the uh, memorials were, which they may or may not. So, yeah. so for example, we do not have a sign that says, um, this is the memorial to the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, that's one that is not visited by very many people, and you can walk by it because nobody says, walk over that bridge, and there's a memorial to those folks that laid their lives on the line for us. Okay, we have uh, another question here, right here. Okay, Patrick, I'm sorry, Patrick, go ahead. That's all right, and you can use my words on your videotape, it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, I do not have a smartphone, I have a dumb phone, but I appreciate and, and think it's fantastic for all these applications that are coming up. There are applications for everything. And I like what Tom is showing there. What I visualize as I see this and I think about interpreting historic uh, layers that we have, let's use Washington, D.C. Think about the possibility of getting with Dan and then as we look at the three-dimensional historic landscape that he did in 1790 or 1810. And as you hold your smartphone in front of you, you can pan around and see that the Lincoln Memorial is not there and that it sticks out into the water. These are some concepts I was thinking about all historic properties in the future might be able to do some sort of historic overlay like that with the smartphone, not just a straight down shot with the maps, but using this three-dimensional imagery and that might bring people in there as well, and I'm just thinking about that. That's a great idea for version 2.0. Uh, okay. And could you help us getting, get some funding for it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, question, uh, uh, Iris, you have a question. Yes, I, it's on. I, I have uh, two, one for Tom, and maybe Susan answered it, but it disappoints me. I didn't see the Japanese lantern on your sign, on your map. There's information about the Japanese lantern, um, you know, and, and we're modifying things all the time, but it's some of those things, we're working on a project at it right now, and it's how much detail do we have on here, how much is too much. So the app is a place where you can get some of those little known, that qualifies as the little known gem at this point in time. Since, since it was here before the Martin Luther King Memorial, and by next year, we'll have an enhanced landscape, as you know. Um, and there are many people that come to the Tidal Basin and know about the cherry trees. It seems to me the lantern is a focal point and should find its way on your maps. The second thing that I want to say is primarily, I think, for Susan and Eliza. I want to compliment you on the pylons. I think they're terrific. My students in Urban Institute Studio propose them for Georgetown along the waterfront uh, several years ago. And we looked at San Francisco, the Embarcadero. I don't know whether you know them, 
but they have similar pylons in black and white. I think the way you've done it is very discreet and quiet and perfect for Washington. Um, so I compliment you on that. If you don't know the ones on the Embarcadero, they also have some historic images that you would see at that location. And so you might take a look at that as well. We, we do need to acknowledge that Hunt Designs out of California was the designer of um, the whole wayfinding and pedestrian guide system, working with Harper's Ferry Center and the Park Service. We have a number of questions. We have one uh, here, uh, the gentleman here. Is there, do you, does anybody have a microphone that have already been given? That would make it easier. Back there, okay. of your uh, 51,000 uh, people that have downloaded, and it's, it's very good. I actually used it yesterday, but I don't know if I've got version 1.0 or 1.1. Where do I find that out? There, there should be um, an About This App section. It's, well, actually, if you go to the um, iTunes, it'll tell you it's actually 1.03. We decided actually not to, to do a 1.1. That is coming out in about a week's time. And uh, th that'll have the, well, tourmobile removed and a few other little changes. Thank you. Okay, a um, question over here, and then we'll go back to the, there's a person in the back with the, right here. I just had a question about the uh, parkways. If you are in a car, I've always found it very confusing you know, driving around the, 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 the monument area. And has there been any effort to improve the signage uh, in that area? It's very minimalist. And I understand why it is, but um, any concerns about that? You mean the, the vehicular signage? Yes. Yeah, that, that's a future project. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, we have a young woman here in back with dark hair. Can we get a microphone to her? You've tried for a while. Yes. OK. Hi. Thank you. Um, my question is, did you think about um, putting an app or, or a sign up there for proposed sites, for example, you know, where the proposed Eisenhower Memorial may be? Uh, you know, we've, we've done that on, on some maps. Um, I don't know whether on our brochures that we've got Eisenhower up yet, but the brochures, I mean, you, every year you're changing. Every year you're finding something that you needed to tweak. I think when Tom talked earlier about the maps and a building moved from one block to another, um, you don't want to take a look too closely at some of the metro maps because some of them are things that maybe happened 20 years ago and there's no longer that road or that parking lot there. So keeping maps up to date can be one of the biggest challenges that we've got for the user as we move forward, and yes, we do try to incorporate um, those things that we know are coming, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, um, we've got the, um, yeah, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Center will be coming, and we've got the, yeah, Americans Disabled for Life, um, so those things are coming, so, um, you know, we try to keep those up on maps. Oh, actually, you want to follow up on that? Oh, sure. Yeah, I, I, th I think the, um, the, the app has the Eisenhower, uh, future Eisenhower Memorial on there. Uh, just a word about the uh, brochure maps that we print. We have a policy to not put future sites on our maps. They're typically updated every one or two years. And in the past, what we've done is we've put uh, uh, sites on maps and they've never materialized. So our kind of our rule of thumb is not until you know they, they break ground and, and open to the public will we uh, let them appear, uh, unless you know orders come from on high or the superintendent of the park signs in blood that uh, they, they will pay for the reprinting of the map if it doesn't uh, <laughs> appear. So. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Okay, sir. Factoid questions. What is the definition of the mall? How much larger is it likely to get? 
and would it maybe in include parts of Rock Creek Park or our National Park Services areas? I guess I'll take that um, because that was one of the things that we were doing in the National Mall plan. Um, the National Mall, from the Park Service's standpoint, now that Union Square has been transferred to the architect of the Capitol, goes from 3rd Street to the Potomac River. It includes um, Constitution Avenue to Independence, and then west of 15th down to the 395 corridor. It goes to the Potomac River. Now, the monumental core of Washington, D.C. includes a lot more. Um, it includes things like the uh, White House and President's Park, which is a separate unit of the Park Service. Um, the National Mall does go up to meet at the edge of Rock Creek Parkway. A lot of these things were covered in the Macmillan plan in terms of that big idea for Washington, D.C. National Mall plan and the center core thing were the planning that we were doing, the fourth kind of a plan for this specific area. Um, we were also planning together at the same time as the National Capital Planning Commission was doing things adjacent to the National Mall. The architect of the Capitol was working on the Capitol Complex Master Plan. DC was working on Center City Action Agenda. So all of these things are correlated. Because you have jurisdictional differences, you have to plan for the jurisdictions you've got. And um, some of those things are why the National Mall Plan was the way that it was. Um, it is compatible with all those other plans, but that's, um, you know, basically um, law does not allow us to go out and plan for everything when other people have responsibilities for that. Um, if you look in the National Mall Plan website, we have defined it by the edges, and I, I described the boundary edges at this point in time. I could, you know, but um, we, um, the mall specifically, portion of the National Mall, National Mall is the umbrella. Mall is a portion of that National Mall, as is the Lincoln Memorial, the Washington Monument grounds, the Jefferson Memorial. All of those things are pieces within that larger umbrella of National Mall. Oh, you want the purpose of the National Mall. Well, the purpose of the National Mall is as, it's got multiple purposes. Commemorative landscape, okay? First Amendment demonstration space for our nation, and not only First Amendment, but a space for national celebrations. It's a historic landscape. It will evolve over time. We hold 3,000 events a year out here. Um, and, but it does have a variety of different purposes. It's our nation's front yard. It's the pilgrimage site for all Americans to come and find out what it means to be an American. It's the place where we hold national celebrations like the 4th of July, as well as presidential inaugurals and presidential birthday celebrations and the uh, National Cherry Blossom Festival and the Folklife Festival and on and on and on. So it's this very special space in the core of our nation that's a public space. Many public spaces around the world are squares, so it's easy to do demonstrations and things. We have a historic landscape, a cultural landscape that serves that same function. It receives a huge amount of wear and tear, and uh, we're taking steps to make it able to, be, to sustain the types and levels of use that it was never designed for. We have a question over here. Amber's coming this way. I'm a technology guy, so I'm, I feel like a kid in a candy store. Where to, where to begin? Um, but specifically on the app, I, I, the good and the bad is, uh, of applications is they're just like paper maps. You have to keep updating them. And one of the things I noticed is that you're using the Google base map, which is no longer free for large volume users. Have you thought about move, migrating in the next version to something like an open product, like an open street map base? Uh, that, that's an excellent question. Uh, I, I mentioned during my talk that the app was delayed toward the end. That was because in April of last year, Google announced that their, their Google Maps API was no longer um, free. And if you wanted to, well, actually, the free version was available, but they reserved the right to put ads on it, whatever they might be. 
um, so that, <laughs> that threw a wrench into the works, and we were scrambling, looking at alternative sources, including uh, you know, OpenStreetMap uh, and, and, and Bing. Um, ev eventually, we, we actually paid Google to use the premier version of, of Google Maps. Uh, we, we've since found out from the solicitor that we no longer have to do it because it's not a web map, it's an app map, uh, and so we're clear there. Plus there was the uh, Department of Interior trying to settle on a mobile uh, map um, application. For a while, Google was verboten, Bing was okay, and now the last I heard this week, we're, we're settling on OpenStreetMap, but um, I'm not absolutely certain on that. Um, I'm right now developing a similar app for, uh, for Boston, and uh, that's actually based on Bing Maps that has been highly um, customized. Because we, we found out that Bing Maps does not work very well on Android devices for some unknown reason. Um, so we, we had to, to, to customize it quite heavily. Thank you. That actually, thank you. Go ahead. That, that actually uh, feeds to the, the second half of the question I was going to ask you, and that is, are you developing future, future apps as native apps on iOS and Android platforms, or are you using cross-platform tools, some of the Adobe products or other things that will uh, you know, try to get you both at once? Okay, I, I'm not a technologist, but I know we're not, uh, we're not doing... Um, we're, we're developing custom apps at this point in time, and I don't know what the future holds in, in this realm. It's, it's changing so quickly. Um, I, I, I will say that all of our park maps now are uh, being converted to geospatial PDFs. So you could use an app uh, like uh, PDF Maps and, and actually have geolocation services with the National Mall uh, map as you, um, as you get around. So that's another <laughs> alternative that we're looking at. And of course, the, uh, the, the big question um, now is it, it's rumored that Apple's going to be coming out with their own mapping service uh, next month. And uh, the whole cartographic community is on the edge of their seat wondering what that might bring, if it indeed is announced. We're going to take one last question. We have several here. I know you had raised your, your hand. Don, so uh, we're going to take this as our last question. Unfortunately, we really got to wrap up. However, our speakers will be here, and you can catch up with them uh, as as we conclude. I hope okay. it's uh, appropriate. I see Pam is still here, and Dick raised a question that made me wonder if she knows when the term mall was first used for ours, and uh, this. Sometimes people say Pell-Mell in London uh, came first, and I'm not sure that that's the case, but anyway. Can we can, uh, we, come on up or we could give you a microphone, one or the other. Um, there is one, in, one instance in L'Enfant's writings where he refers to it as the mall. And uh, I, when I found that, I looked up the history of the word mall, um, and it's the same spelling in French, but the pronunciation is my. And it was a ball game that you play with a stick. And the players uh, play it by walking down a long greensward uh, and keep going and hitting the ball. Uh, Paul Mall in London was the place where you played that game when it was first created. So it has that uh, etymological background. So once again, if you have further questions, please speak to our speakers uh, after we have exited the stage. And I want to thank you deeply and sincerely for joining us. And Ralph, do you want to say anything to wrap up? Thank you. yesterday for sharing their knowledge and insight in the role of maps in visualizing the nation's capital. I also want to thank the moderators uh, and, uh, and uh, the audience itself for your participation and thoughtful questions. Many persons within the library have contributed to this conference. Uh, Dan Rose, Special Events Coordinator, uh, did a tremendous job in just uh, doing all the background work. Don Urschel, Public Affairs a Specialist in Library's Public Affairs Office. Uh, John Regan, who uh, did all of the great uh, display work with the images and uh, really appreciate what he did. 
and of course the staff of the Geography Map Division, you met many of them over the past two days. I want to mention the work of two persons uh, that really stand out for special recognition, the Roberta Stevens, uh, using her great experience she gained for managing the Library of Congress bicent Bicentennial and the National Book Festival for many years. And she used that to put on not what I think is a great conference uh, the past two days. She did all of the production work behind us. The other is Ed Redman, who worked very closely with the speakers in uh, helping them get their uh, illustrations together and uh, getting everything online and, and guiding them along the way. I don't think he's with us. Uh, he's with uh, Congressman Osterman right now, who is uh, touring the division uh, before the exhibit opens. But uh, he, he, he deserves special recognition as well. I've had a lot of questions on uh, whether these papers will be available, and yes, they will be. Uh, the library's online website at www.loc.gov uh, has, web, has a webcasts, and uh, we hope to have this up within a, uh, in the month, I hope. And we also plan to publish the proceedings of the conference to ensure a permanent record. Uh, I, I invite you to join us at 1.30 for a, a tour uh, of the early maps of Washington. I mentioned the font plan will be there, Ellicott's original plan, and two surveyors from the Surveyors Historical Society have brought in about eight boxes of surveying equipment, and they've got it all set up. I, uh, it's, it'll be a, a rare uh, opportunity to look at the uh, instruments that the surveyors actually use to prepare the font plan and the Ellicott plan. Geography Map Division is located in room B1 in the basement off the Madison Building Central Core Elevators. On the way out, on your exit, we've put out two free maps for you. Everybody likes free maps, I know. Uh, courtesy of the U.S. Geological Survey, it just happened to coincide with this conference. They put out a, uh, printed a map in April, custom, uh, you know, limited edition map uh, on the historical, uh, development of the waterways in Washington, D.C. On one side, on the other is a beautiful uh, satellite photo of the city. And the uh, D.C. Commission of Arts and Humanities uh, have published a, an alternate map uh, for tourists, which is very interesting. Finally, I'd like, if you enjoyed this conference the past two days, and I think from the remarks I heard you have, uh, we'd like to remind you again that this was financed by the Philip Lee Phillips Society. This, you know, was co-produced with the Library of Congress, but the uh, production cost really came from the Phillips Society. So again, I hope uh, that you'll consider us as an organization you might want to join. Um, we offer this annual conference. We offer uh, a quarterly newsletter that will keep you up to date with the Geography and Map Division. And the current one has a very nice article by Roberta on <coughs> what we're doing in the digital area. So don't forget your membership forms <laughs> and your brochure. Read that tonight. So we invite you to join the uh, society. Thank you again. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.